So thank you for the invitation to come and talk about, uh, about SAMS. Um, so the idea here is that I will tell you a bit about the, the, the basic principles of SANS so that if, even if you don't know the details about the instrumentation, if you've never done an experiment, you will at least uh, um, know uh, if it's useful for your experiment or for your project. So, so if, you, if you should think about using it or not. And of course, then you can contact uh, uh, an instrument scientist at your favorite neutron center and, and sort out the details and discuss your, your specific experiment. Um, so today I will tell you about uh, what a SANS experiment is and some of it you already heard uh, with Frank Cabell. Um, so I can, I can question you about it to see if you understood everything. <laughs> uh, no, but some of it you are, will already know, but we'll go over it uh, real quick. Uh, I will also tell you about the, the SANS scattering process so the different contributions and the, uh, basically how you get your signal and, and why you would use it. Uh, we'll, we'll look into uh, the typical SANS data analysis uh, uh, that you do for, uh, for uh, more for biopolymer solutions. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, data quality and I'll give you some recommendations when you're planning a, um, a SANS experiment. Okay. So in life sciences and, and uh, biomaterials, SANS is a very powerful technique uh, because uh, uh, typical samples have a, a, a very large uh, hierarchy of, uh, of structures. So you can go from, from uh, a small polymers or a small protein, let's say, to a, to a very large structure, you know, as big as a virus, for example, or even a cell. Um, so SANS is very powerful because it can cover a broad range of, uh, of sizes. Um, in terms of small angle scattering in general, if you want to, comp uh, to compare with complementary probes and depending on your background, this, this may be useful for you to understand uh, the, where neutrons are placed uh, in terms of the experimental techniques. Uh, so X-rays typically use slightly shorter uh, wavelength ranges. Uh, neutrons cover the range that you see here from one to about 20 angstroms. Uh, and light scattering will cover larger sizes, so you can imagine that you are looking at, at different sizes of things, uh, even though there's a, a lot of overlap uh, with, the, with the different uh, probes. Now, of course, also, the, depending on the probe that you use, the, the exact information that you're extracting, what you're measuring, is not exactly the same. So even though I tell you that it overlaps, uh, the interactions are different. So X-rays are interacting with electrons, neutrons are interacting with nuclei. And with light scattering, you get a signal from differences in, in refractive, refractive index. So you're not quite measuring the exact same thing, even though, of course, your sample is, is the same. Um, so the nature of the radiation will determine, for example, the sample environment that you can, that you can use. So neutrons, for example, are a non-destructive probe. So you, you, might, you may be able to, for example, use a, a pressure cell or other environments because they will cross different materials. Um, the lens scales that can be probed are different. And even the nature of the, of the information. So, what can you what can you measure with all with, with these with small angle scattering in, in general? So, there are a lot of uh, structural aspects that you can measure from size, shape, even fractal dimension. We're going to go over this a little bit, uh, and also phenomena. You can look at self assembly, phase transitions, uh, thermodynamics, kinetics. So, a lot of different um, different phenomena. And it may seem a bit overwhelming if you've never used it to know if you if you can use it or not for your for your research but that's why we're here to, trying to give you some background and of course you can always talk to to instrument scientists about your project okay so if you've never done a science experiment what is it so the the basics of it is shown here in this uh, schematics uh, so you'll have incoming neutrons and this can be from a, a spallation or a reactor based uh, source i will not go over too much about how we produce neutrons we can discuss it if you if you want afterwards uh, there will be some way in which uh, you can select the wavelength or the wavelength range that you want to use. Uh, here I'm showing just a velocity selector that would select the wavelength of interest. Um, there'll be a source aperture that defines the, the size of the source. And then we have some collimation guides and apertures uh, that we use to define the, the, the flux and the coherence that you're going to have. Uh, then you have a sample aperture, you have your sample, and there's scattering. So the scattering will happen at some angle. So the scattering angle two theta that I'm showing you there. Uh, and in, in very, very basic terms, a scattering experiment is basically uh, an experiment where you're measuring 
um, how the intensity of the scattering varies with the, with this angle of two theta here uh, on the detector. Um, now it's called small angle scattering because we are measuring very small angles. So if you if you look at the at the, the, the correspondence between the scattering angle and the wavelength that you use and this d, which is the the real space uh, distance or feature in your sample, if you think about the typical ranges that we're using that we're measuring. The angles that we're looking at are typically from 0.3 to about five degrees. So they are very small angles, what we're trying to do. So if you've done crystallography, these angles correspond to that range of data next to the beam stop that you very often actually um, reject from your data. <laughs> so it is very small angle data. Okay, so I believe Frank already showed you a, a version of this, uh, of this uh, schematic. So this is very basic idea of the, of the scattering process. So you, you have an incident plane wave uh, of neutrons um, and the neutrons will see a, a nucleus. So remember they interact with the nucleus, not with the electron density cloud, like an X-rays. Uh, and there will be an interaction uh, between the, the, the neutron and the nucleus. And, and the, the nucleus will then scatter as a, as a, a spherical wave. Uh, and you can describe the spherical wave with a, with a wave function that will have an amplitude uh, that is proportional to the scattering length uh, and to the distance to the detector. Now, the scattering length quantifies the, the strength of the interaction between the, the, the incoming neutron uh, and, the, and the nucleus. Um, and so the, when, you, when the neutron comes in, it'll, there'll be an interaction and there will be also a momentum transfer. So there'll be a, a, a change in the, in, the, in the wave number that comes in. Let's look at this with a typical triangle scattering. Um, so in real space, you have the incoming neutron with some, some velocity, some, some speed coming in and then coming out at some angle. Uh, and this, in this case, your sample is like your single uh, nucleus. Uh, in recyclical space, you have a, a, a wave vector coming in and then there's a change in direction on the, on the wave vector going out at a certain angle. And the difference between these two vectors is what we call the scattering vector or the momentum transfer vector, if you will. And it's, it's, it measures basically the difference uh, between these two vectors. And if there's also a transfer in, in energy, uh, we, can, we can measure that as well. Now for for a small angle neutron scattering, uh, what we are measuring is elastic scattering. So basically there's no change in the amplitude of the wave vector that comes in when it goes out. There's only a change in direction. Um, and it is then very simple. It's basic trigonometry. If you, if you, if you look at this triangle, it's very simple to show that your Q, your scattering vector, is 2K sine of theta. So this is half the scattering angle here. And if you know Bragg's law, it's straightforward to get to this relation that, uh, that you will see many times in your publications between uh, the scattering angle and the wavelength and the, and the um, sorry, the scattering vector, the wavelength and the, and the half the scattering angle. In real space, the distances that you're measuring, and I believe Frank also mentioned this to you, uh, are, have a reciprocal relationship to Q. So uh, when you're measuring small Q, uh, you are actually drawing information about, uh, about largest spacings or largest distances in your sample or correlations. Uh, and when you're measuring large Q, you're, you're at, at a high resolution, if you will, if you come from uh, the crystallography background. Um, so you're measuring smaller distances, okay? <clears throat> So let's uh, look at the geometry of the SANS experiment. So you have your incident neutron hitting a sample uh, and there'll be scattering that, that can be defined in this uh, solid angle, d omega, that you see here. And if your detector is far away enough, uh, you can actually define this, uh, this uh, d omega angle and this uh, two theta angle uh, very precisely. Um, and so we can also define a differential scattering cross section which is basically the, the, the number of neutrons scattered into this uh, solid angle, d omega per second, uh, normalized by the flux. Uh, and it can be shown, it's, it's straightforward to show if you, if you think about the definition of beam flux and its solid angle, that this differential scattering cross section is actually b squared. So remember the, in the wave function, the amplitude uh, was b squared, uh, sorry, it was the b over r. So if you square that, you get the amplitude. Now the total uh, scattering cross section, which, which is actually what we measure when we do an experiment, it's called, also called a microscopic uh, cross section, uh, is the integral of the differential scattering cross section. 
Um, and so basically you are now uh, uh, in integrating over four pi. So, so instead of just the one angle, we're integrating into all directions. And you get to this, uh, to this equation that basically tells it's four pi over the square uh, of the scattering length. Now the units of the, 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 the microscopic cross section which, which you measure are units of area. Uh, so you will also see them referred to as, uh, as, uh, as a barn, the unit is barn, which is 10 to the minus 24. So you'll see that a lot when you look at uh, tables of scattering cross section. Now the, the result that we want in the end, of course, is not the one for the one nucleus, you want the result for your full sample. So we normalize the microscopic cross section here to the entire volume of the sample. And we, so that we then can compare results measured uh, in different experiments or with different samples. Uh, and once your data is reduced, you get to absolute units of centimeter minus one. So in the tutorial, uh, you'll use data that is already reduced. So the intensities, the units of the intensities there are, are centimeters minus one. Uh, and this is what is the, the, the information that we can actually relate to, our, uh, to the information on our sample that we want to from our experiment. Um, now, again, if we do, uh, if we do the, the differential of the microscopic cross section, what do we get? What, what information is in there? Um, again, we're, we're integrating for our entire sample. And, uh, and at, at, for small angle scattering, we use uh, relatively long wavelengths and we're measuring very small angles. So the information that we're getting is not about uh, uh, interatomic distances. We're not looking at that level of resolution. We're looking at, at larger uh, distances than the interatomic. And in that case, what the neutrons see is a, is, um, a density of, uh, of scattering lengths. So, so it's, it's a, a, a density of a material, not interatomic distances. So when we integrate, when we do the Fourier transform, what we get is actually a scattering length density distribution. So you see the amplitude there. Uh, and the meaning of this, uh, this uh, amplitude square, square is that we actually lose the phase information. So we cannot just do uh, an inverse Fourier and, and uh, obtain the, the macroscopic cross section again, which is an, uh, an important result. Um, and also, if you think about the, the, the density in here, what you have then when you're measuring small angle scattering is an average density of your sample, and there will be oscillations around that average. So when, when the, the scattering length density varies, so for example, as, you, as you're looking at your sample or your molecule, let's say it's a protein molecule, uh, as, as opposed to your uh, solvent, there will be some, uh, some, um, some difference there, like you would have, for example, with light scattering and refractive index. And this is what we're actually measuring. Uh, it's where the signal actually comes from with small angle scattering. It comes from uh, inhomogeneities in the scattering length density. Um, yeah. So just to step back for a second, let's look at the dimensions of the things that we are measuring. So if you look at the at sizes of different things, so for example, the wavelength of the neutron uh, is comparable to the, the interatomic distances that, we're, that uh, your sample uh, has. The atomic nuclei, on the other hand, are smaller by a factor of four. So for neutrons, you're the, the, the nuclei are actually a, a, a point scatterer because they are so much smaller than the wavelength of the uh, of the neutron itself. Um, the scattering cross sections are, are on the order, the similar order um, of magnitude. Uh, that's the velocity of the neutrons there, just out of interest. And the typical neutron flux that you'll have at the sample, it'll vary in the, that, by, depending on the instrument that you're using, but typically it's around uh, 10 to the seven. Now this has a, a few um, implications and assumptions that we do when we look at small angle neutron scattering data. Um, and before we move on, I just wanted to list them there for you. So um, just to remind you, some neutrons will pass through the sample undeviated, right? So the neutrons, remember they interact with the nuclei, not with the, the electron density cloud. So they can go through the sample uh, undeviated. Uh, we assume when we're interpreting the data, in most cases anyway, that the, the, the neutrons will undergo a single scattering event so that there's no multiple scattering uh, from one nucleus to the other. Um, we also assume that the incident beam is not significant distur significantly disturbed by the medium. Uh, and we assume that the nuclei are fixed at their position in the solution. That's why if you look at the, the tables for cross sections, you'll see that uh, they're they're listed as bound cross sections. So basically, we're assuming that the nuclei cannot um, uh, recoil 
or that they're not moving so that they cannot impart energy on the on the on the neutron, the incoming neutron, which is an assumption, of course. Okay. So where does the signal come from and what are the different components? So the total scattering that you're measuring uh, comes from three major components. So there's a coherent component, an incoherent, and an absorption component. So if you look at the little schematics at the bottom here, um, one of three things can happen to a neutron. It can get transmitted, so it'll go through your sample. It can get scattered, and that's what we want to measure, or it can get absorbed. And your sample will have some, some thickness that you will define for your experiment. And this is one of the parameters that you actually decide when you're going to do a neutron experiment. And we can, uh, we can quantify the, the absorption by measuring the, the intensities or the flux, if you want, uh, that goes through a sample compared to the incoming um, flux of neutrons. Now, this absorption actually reduces the signal to noise of what you want to measure, and it's, it's wavelength dependent. Now, the other two components uh, are our main concern, typically. So the signal that you want is your coherent signal. Uh, and what the signal is, is, is uh, um, it, it comes from correlations between, uh, uh, between positions in your different sample, uh, in your sample. So basically it's the, it's the structure of your sample and, it's, and that is Q dependent and it's why we measure the intensities at different Qs. Uh, now your incoherent signal comes from, which for all intents and purposes is the noise or the background for your, for your SANS experiment. Um, now it comes from the, 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 the fact that there are different nuclei in your sample that have different spin states. Um, so, so for example, even for the same element, there are different spin states for certain nucleus if they're, if they're uh, non-zero spin. And so the interactions can, uh, can vary in ways that are not related to your structure. So you'll have an, a, a, a type of scattering that is not Q-dependent and that is kind of a flat uh, background for your, for your data. And this you can think of as your, uh, as your noise really. Um, so how do you know what your sample will do and how, how much of these three components you have? So you can look at, you can look up tables. Um, for the absorption contribution in particular, if you know the isotopic uh, composition of your sample, uh, you can calculate it fairly accurately. So you can look up the different contributions from the different elements and you, you, can, you can actually have an estimate of what the absorption composition or the, is expe the expected absorption uh, contribution is. Uh, the incoherent contribution is um, slightly less straightforward <laughs> uh, because uh, it, it depends, as I told you, it, it, it depends on the, it's not, uh, it doesn't have in information about the positions or correlations in your sample, uh, and it is dependent on the, on the movement, so at the, at the positions of atoms at different points in time, so it's, it's related to dynamics and it's temperature dependent, so it's, a, it's more difficult to estimate it. Uh, and the, the coherent uh, contribution as well, it's because it's dependent on the structure and, and a priori you don't know it. Uh, you can get an estimate, but again, you, you don't know it very, very accurately. So you, you have an idea by looking up tables of, as to what to expect, uh, but it's not, not necessarily straightforward. Um, now, just to step back for a minute, so here we're comparing, so on the, on the vertical, you have the penetration depth uh, of, the, of the probe that we're using, and we're comparing neutrons, x-rays, and electrons. And at the bottom, you just have the atomic number. And you can see that the higher the atomic number for x-rays, which are the, the squares here, the, the less penetration that you get because the interaction gets stronger and stronger, so they penetrate uh, less and less materials. Uh, similar for electrons. And then for neutrons, you have these triangles here, and they're all over the place. But you can see that the penetration depth is typically on the order of centimeters. Um, and it is not depending on the atomic number, of course, because we're interacting with the nuclei and the nuclei have different, uh, uh, different characteristics depending on, not only on the element, but on the isotope uh, as well. Uh, and this is why neutrons can do cool things like you see on the image here. So they can uh, look into um, uh, a high atomic number of materials like the metal that you see here. Uh, and they are sensitive to, to the presence of uh, lighter elements. And so we can get a cool image like you see there. <clears throat> so going back to the cross sections. So here you have your neutron scattering lengths on the left. And at the bottom, you just have the typical atoms that you'll see or typical nuclei that you'll see um, 
in biological samples. So these are very often present for in proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, etc. Also on your buffer, um, and you can see a few uh, interesting things. So you're in green, you have your coherent signal, and in red, you have your incoherent. And I told you that you can think of your incoherent signal as your noise. So if you remember that, that hydrogen is uh, arguably the, the, the most abundant uh, and most important element in biology, you should start worrying because of course you can see that there's a big contribution from the incoherent scattering. So you have a lot of noise when you have a lot of incoherent scattering in your, in your sample. Um, you can also see that the, the contributions for hydrogen and deuterium and uh, just isotopes are very different. So for, for deuterium, not only the coherent scattering is positive, as it is also approximately double that of, of hydrogen, but also it has this very interesting um, feature, if you will, that the incoherent scattering contribution is much, much smaller than that of hydrogen. Uh, and this is the reason why, the main reason why we, uh, when you do a SANS experiment, you will almost certainly be using uh, D2O buffers instead of H2O. So you're trying to reduce uh, this, uh, this contribution. It is also the reason why we can uh, obtain different signals and almost tune the signal that we want uh, by playing with the percentage of uh, hydrogen and deuterium uh, in our sample, as I think uh, uh, Frank has already showed you. Will do. Okay. So going back to the, the general idea of small angle uh, neutron scattering. So if you, so on the right here, you have real space and with a, just a little cartoon uh, description. And on the left, you have the reciprocal space. And if you focus on the right here for a second, and if you think that your sample is a molecule, here it's represented as a very anguished fish. Um, but if you have your molecule in a, in a buffer, uh, like you have here, uh, what you, you're gonna, be wanting to do is reconstitute what you, from the data you, you're gonna be wanting to reconstitute what you, what you have in your sample. So basically the structure. So you're gonna be wanting to know what's the contribution to my scattering that comes from the, the, the molecule itself, which is the fish here uh, that has a certain volume. So the, the, you're gonna add that, the, add the contribution from the solvent itself. And then you're gonna to wanna to subtract the contribution uh, from the solvent that is not present because your, your molecule is there, right? So you have your what we call the excluded particle volume. So in terms of reciprocal space on the left, what does that correspond to? So the intensities that you measure, they're proportional to the signal that comes from your molecules, and you have your, your scattering length density there, um, and you're going to integrate that for the, the volume of the sample. You're going to add the contribution from the solvent. Now, the, the solvent is, uh, for all intents and purposes, of infinite extent compared to your, to your molecule and, and, and to the process. So uh, it's, it's a delta function everywhere except for q equals zero. Uh, so we don't observe it in, in, in practice. So this is basically zero. And then you want to subtract the contribution from the excluded, excluded particle volume. So it should be something similar to what you have here for your molecule, except the scattering length density now is for your solvent. So you want to subtract that. And this is how we come to the concept of, of contrast, that you have to, to subtract the contribution of your solvent to the, to the, uh, from the contribution of your, uh, your molecule or your fish, if you want there. Uh, and before we go on to contrast, I'll just talk a little bit about buffer subtraction because it's actually important. So the image that you have there is just an example of data on, that was collected on lysozyme solution uh, at different pressures. Uh, so you see from ambient to about uh, five kilobars. So five kilobars is about 5,000 atmospheres, just for reference. Um, so, and you, you have your, uh, your cross sections here on the, on the vertical axis. So if you look at this inset here, uh, you can see that the, the lysozyme, the cross section of the lysozyme solution, which includes the buffer and the protein, uh, has a, a, a profile, as you see up there. And this profile is actually the sum of the contributions from the protein itself, the lysozyme, and the buffer. Uh, and it, it, it changes with uh, different pressures, and, and this is a story for another day. But basically, you, you get the point that, that you have to add these two contributions to get your lysozyme uh, solution. Uh, and what you don't want is that the signal from the, the, the buffer is, uh, is basically the major contributor to the signal in your, in your scattering. Now, if you go back here to your experimental data, you see different curves collecting at different pressures and it's color coded. So you can see that, for example, this uh, top curve here, uh, which is the highest pressure, uh, the data from your molecules on the top and this flat line that you see is your buffer 
that was measured as well. So we measure both. You measure, you measure the protein solution and you measure just the buffer. Um, and if you've prepared your samples right, your buffer should match exactly the, the, the background of your sample at this high Q here. Uh, and you can then subtract the buffer contribution from your protein and you have your reduced data. Now, if you look at, other cur at the other curves and the reasons why this happens under pressure are, are not, are not uh, um, important here, but the important thing to, to see is that sometimes it doesn't match. So for example, for this green curve here, you can see that the, the solvent is a, a bit lower than your protein. Same for the red curve and same for the slight blue and the black curves. Now, when this happens, in this case, it's an effect of the pressure. But if you're if you're um, it's just measuring at a standard condition, and the, te the standard temperature, and you have no other reason for this to happen, then you'd have to either apply a, a flat background subtraction, or you'd have to scale the contribution from your buffer. And you can imagine that uh, that you 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 can introduce errors from this. So what you you really want is that your buffer matches the, 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 the background of your sample here at high Q, where there are no more uh, structural features being sensed. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then there, there are a few reasons. Uh, typically, the reason for that is that you're, you, you have a, what we call the buffer mismatch. So when you prepared your sample, uh, there's slightly different percentages of, uh, of deuterium, for example, in your buffer or of salt. So you have to be very careful to make sure that your buffer matches. Uh, you could also have air bubbles in your buffer uh, or on your protein sample, or you can have them on one and not the other. So air bubbles are a problem because not only they decrease the volume that, uh, of sample that you're exposing, but also if they are of the right size, which is the size that we're measuring here in, in this Q range. So if they have the size that the experiment has the resolution to, to see, uh, if you will, uh, they will contribute to the, to the scattering. Uh, then other reasons are, for example, incoherent or multiple scattering. Uh, and also incorrect data scaling. So if you if you if you haven't scaled your data properly, you can also have uh, issues like that. Um, okay, so let's go back to contrast. Um, so I believe uh, Frank has already shown showed you an example. So I won't go too much into it, uh, but still I want to mention it because it's it's important. It's one of the main reasons why you use uh, SAMS. Uh, so your your contrast in SAMS, as I told you when I showed you the fish. Uh, it comes from the difference between the scattering intensity of your sample and that of the, the, the medium that it's in, so your solvent, if you will. Uh, and when you hear, uh, you hear us talking about contrast, it's the scattering length density contrast, and it's the square uh, of, of this difference. So now we come to this uh, magic formula that you will see many, many times, uh, and that you should, um, hopefully you will, you will remember. If nothing else, please remember this, uh, <laughs> this formula. Uh, your intensities will be proportional, of course, to the, the particle volume fraction um, and the particle volume itself. They, they are proportional to the contrast uh, on, uh, of your sample, to a form factor that describes the, the shape of your molecule, so the shape of your fish. And if your fish start talking to each other and they start influencing each other and interacting, then there's, there will also be what we call a structure factor uh, that we also need to model uh, to, to fit our data. So let's look at the contrast just a little bit more in detail for a second. Um, so the contrast, as I told you, it's the difference between the scattering intensity of your molecule and the medium that it's in. So your black line that you see here, uh, sorry, the vertical axis is the, the scattering intensity. And then on the bottom, you have the percentage of D2O. Uh, and this black line is basically the scattering length density of, of water as it, as it goes from H2O to pure uh, D2O. So it'll increase. Um, and for example, if you look at uh, this uh, dark blue line here, you have the signal for a, for a protein. Again, as you increase the percentage of D2O in your, in your buffer, the labile hydrogens in your molecule will start exchanging. So you expect a slight increase in the signal as well. And at some point, something interesting happens is that these uh, scattering length densities cross. So you can see here, roughly around 40% in this case, uh, the, the scattering length density crosses. Uh, what this means is that you have the same signal from your protein and from your solvent, so the contrast is then zero. So basically, you don't see the protein in your sample. So you can imagine that if you had a system, for example, that had DNA present there, at this point when you were using 40% D2O, you would not see the contribution from the protein, but you would still see the contribution from your DNA. And imagine you have a protein DNA complex, for example. 
the complex is still there, but you are now focusing on the contribution from the DNA alone. Why would you use, for example, a contrast or a percentage of D2O uh, that was equivalent to the point where the DNA now matches the solvent? You would still see a signal, so it's a difference, remember, from your protein, contribution from your protein, but not from the DNA. So it's basically tuning different components of interest in your, in your system, uh, just like you see in the image here on the left. So here you have a, a representation of a sort of a core shell structure or even a micelle, if you will. And you can see that the, 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 the structure and solution is still there and it's always the same. We have not separated the different components, so we are still looking at them as they are when they are in a, in a full intact complex. But when you're in 100% D2O, this is just a, a schematics to give you a, a feeling of what contrast is. You are basically looking at the, the, the core structure here. So you'd, you'd be investigating the structure of the core. It, as you start increasing the percentage of hydrogen in your sample, you start, start seeing contributions from both of them because the scattering length densities of both components differ from that of the solvent. And then as you approach the 0% the, the, the T2O, now you're matching the core of the, the molecule. So you'd basically be seeing the contributions from the shell. So you can see how this is useful to, so for us to work out the, the, how different uh, uh, complexes arrange and what's the structure uh, when, when, the, when the whole the intact particle is there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about structure factors. So those little fish that I told you about, if you use high enough concentration uh, or, or depending on the structure that they have, they may want to talk to each other, so they will have some interactions. Uh, and when that happened, remember that magical formula that I showed you, you have a, a contribution from this interaction. So this is the structure factor SFQ here. And I've started introducing this factor that I didn't show you before. This is basically the background. So your signal will have the contribution from your, from your molecule. And there will also be a background that we typically subtract, but just so to get you used to this uh, factor that is always present. Uh, this is the incoherent background that we subtract. Um, so your, your structural factor actually, if you have an isotropic system uh, and interactions are all uniform, uh, regardless of the shape of your, of your molecule, your structure factor can be uh, calculated and it's a, a function of, the, um, uh, of this G of R, which is a radial distribution function. Uh, and it's governed by the interaction potential. So by the type of, uh, of potential or the type of interaction, if you will, uh, between the different molecules of the, how, how the different fish interact, if you will. Um, and now the, this, uh, um, this potential, if we knew exactly the type of interaction, we could calculate it very precisely and we could then model our structure factors. But in biology, as I'm sure you already know, uh, the samples don't behave like we want to. They will not do exactly what we want. <laughs> and one of the things that they, they don't do is they, don't, they are not necessarily um, uniform. So you'll have uh, slightly different shapes of molecules in there. Uh, plus the interactions between them are not necessarily isotropic. So they have a, a certain shape. Uh, and depending on the orientation of the different molecules or of the different fish, the, the interaction between them will, be, will differ. Um, and, and so what we effectively measure is, is this uh, S prime structure factor and a parent structure factor or, or effective structure factor, if you will, that is affected by the, the fact that the, the interactions between the molecules are, are not isotropic. They, they, they will vary depending on the orientation. And so to account for that, what we typically do is we, we use this, uh, it's called a decoupling approximation. So we, we introduce a little factor, this beta factor here, um, that takes into account the, the effects of, of the orientation of your, of your, of your molecule. So it, it, it basically introduces a little fudge factor into your uh, parent set structure factor, and it helps us uh, module. Uh, and you will see this in the, in the tutorial that we're going to do after. Uh, if your system is monodispersed, now this, this beta factor will be one, and you're back to the, the structure factor of your molecule alone. But very, very often, or more often than not really, what you're measuring is this uh, uh, effective structure factor. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we model this uh, structure factor? So at, at, uh, at uh, the forward scattering intensity, which is the intensity for the Q angle zero, uh, your structure factor is actually proportional to the osmotic compressibility um, that you see there in, in red. This is just the Boltzmann constant in, in temperature. And the osmotic compressibility uh, uh, is a very interesting <laughs> 
a parameter for many for many reasons. It depends on the sector and material coefficients, which is also uh, tells you gives you information about interaction between the particles, but also the molecular weight and the concentration of your sample. Um, you do want to know the concentration of your sample with accuracy, as we'll, we'll go into that in a, in a second. Uh, so, for example, if you're if you're interested in, uh, in the different phases of the, of your system, if you're interested in the effects of uh, of, uh, for example, of pressure, uh, and you can read a, a little bit more about how to use pressure. I put the reference there uh, with SAMS. Then the, this forward scattering intensity has a lot of information about the about the types of interactions that you have in your in your sample. And these interactions can have can be of different na uh, nature. So there, I, I plot different types of uh, structure factors, and you, you have a diameter here uh, on the on the x-axis. Um, and you can see that you can have, for example, a cool arm repulsion. So if you if you have charged particles, if your molecules mostly charged, then you'll have a certain type of interaction. If your sample is more like a hard sphere, which is not charged, then you'll have a different type. And again, if you have an, an attractive square well interaction, another. And you can see that at the at these uh, shorter, uh, sorry, at these larger uh, distance. So basically, at low Q, if you want. Uh, these contributions are, are are stronger. Okay, so so it will affect your data more at uh, at lower Q. And I'll, I'll show you plots in a, in a second. Um, but what we're doing by analyzing our structure factors is is looking at the types of interactions that we have present. So not only can we see the structure of the molecules, but we can also see the types of interactions. Uh, and, and this is a tremendous advantage of scan, of SANS as well. Okay, so back to our magic formula. Uh, if you have an attraction or a repulsion type of interaction, uh -huh. yes. Excuse me. Uh, just quick question: What is uh, the difference between um, structure factor like S and S prime? Okay, so that's good. Uh, good question. So, if you have your just your molecule and there are interactions between your molecule, you have just your structure factor like you see on the top here. I don't know if you see my my mouse. But uh, and and this uh, structure factor is the the structure factor that you would have if your molecule, let's say, was just a sphere, and the and these spheres were um, all the same across your samples, all the same size, and regardless of the direction in which you measured, so regardless of your Q angle, if you will, the interactions would always be the same. But in reality, your protein can be, let's say, it's an intrinsically disordered protein in solution. So depending on the direction, uh, you know, on the relative orientation of these uh, two molecules, the types of interactions will be very different. So the so our samples are not as simple as we'd like them to be, basically. <laughs> um, so it so the 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 direction uh, in which they interact does matter, and in that case, uh, uh, what we're measuring is actually an uh, an apparent structure factor. Uh, or, or or an effective structure factor, if you will, and then we introduce this uh, B factor that actually takes into account the fact that the orientation of the molecules uh, matters. We can't just apply an average form factor and, and, and then work out our interactions. Um, and you, you will do that in the tutorials. You, you will see, you will introduce this factor and you will see the effect on the, on the fitting. So this is this S prime that I, that I now uh, refer to. It's basically the same thing, but, but more realistic, if you will. <laughs> uh, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Right, so going back to our intensities, uh, uh, looking at our structure factors again, and here I, I just put a little reminder of the different uh, things that you're looking at as you as you plot uh, in intensities versus Q. So remember this reciprocal relationship uh, between Q and the real space dimension. So at low Q, you're measuring sizes and the intermediate shape. And when you get to higher Q, you're now looking into uh, more details of the internal structure. Okay, so if you have different types of uh, interactions, Let's say you have your form factor here, your F of Q for your molecule. What you measure in the end is, is really the, 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 the combination of these two, uh, the, the, the form factor and the structure factor. And if you have some attractive uh, interaction, you, you'll have a curve similar to this. And the, the sum of, or the combination of the two, not the sum, uh, it, it will then show a little uh, upturn here. So if you see an upturn, it's, it's typically because you have some sort of attraction potential on your, on your sample. Uh, and then you have to use what you know about your sample as well to, to try to find out what types of uh, inter potential or interaction to expect. If it's a repulsive interaction, then you, you'll have this the, the downturn here. Uh, and when you combine the form and the structure factor, you'll see this downturn 
Uh, and again, we'll look at this again, but just to give you a, a more uh, intuitive feeling uh, of what, what to expect. Okay, let's go back to the form factors. So we've looked at this uh, parent or effective structure factor. What about this form factor, which is very, very often what you're really interested in from your sample. So this form factor is, is basically the, the shape of your single molecule, right? So in space, you'll have a molecule, for example, like a sphere with a certain radius. Um, and in real space as well, you will have some, some density that is zero when you're, you, you move past the dim dimensions uh, of this uh, radius. Uh, and it will have a certain average density when you're, when you're under uh, that dimension. In Fourier space, so if we look at the normalized uh, form factor, and this is just a form factor for, the, the, for a, a sphere, you'll have some, some signal that could look like this, for example, if you had this uh, uh, perfect sphere, like I told you, it's always the same say, a shape, always the same uh, size, perfectly uh, uniform. Now in reality, of course, and, this, and I cannot overemphasize this, in reality, uh, our samples will be polydispersed very, very, very likely, uh, to, some, to some extent at least. Um, so polydispersities up to 20% are very, very common. So if you're doing a, a biopolymer, if you're looking at biopolymer solutions, uh, this is to be expected. It's also to be minimized, but, but be aware that this will happen. So what happens to your data? So your data is then smeared out a little. So the more polydispersed your sample is, uh, the more smeared out your intensities will be. And this um, smearing can not only come from the sample, but it can also come from the instrument itself. So the instruments have a finite coherence in, in Q. Um, and so that too will cause some, uh, some smearing uh, of your data. And when you're fitting your data, so what you have there is uh, you, you see the little points that those are your data, of course. Um, and then in red, you have the model for a, a spherical shell where smearing was not taken into account. And you can see that the model doesn't fit the data, uh, particularly in, the, in these uh, troughs that you see here. Uh, but once you introduce the, the smearing that comes from the instrument, then the, the fit is much, much better to the data, and that's the blue line uh, that you see there. And you'll do that uh, as well in, in your tutorial. I will, I will show you that when we do, when we fit our data, we, uh, we take into account the instrumental smearing, which comes with your, with your uh, small angle scattering data. So when you, when you collect your data, the information on the smearing is on the same file. And when you're fitting your data, you, you use that information uh, to, to know what to expect. Uh, so basically you add the smearing to your, to your model. Um, and the, and the, if you don't remember anything else about data fitting, remember that you always add smearing to your model and you don't desmear your data, okay? And we'll talk about this a little bit more in your, in your tutorial, but this is an important uh, point. Okay, so let's look at how we analyze our SANS data. So let's assume we have our SANS data and we, we have as good a data as we could get. If we're in the dilute uh, uh, low Q regime, so basically we're in the regime where we're looking at sizes that are larger than the size of your uh, molecule. So let's say your molecule again is this uh, deceiving uh, perfect sphere <laughs> that you have there. Remember, I told you we have this uh, effective structure factor that we can uh, um, approximate. We can introduce a, a fudge factor, if you will, that takes into account the fact that uh, there are different, um, uh, different shapes present in there and that interactions depend on the orientation. For dilute solutions, typically um, this beta factor that you have there is zero and your, your apparent structure factor just goes back to being your regular structure factor. So they're both the same and approximately one. Uh, and in that case, your forward scattering intensity and will just be proportional to, uh, to the, your scattering intensity uh, and to the, the, the number density of, of your particles. So basically, you, you get this molecular weight information back here. So if you can extrapolate your data, so remember at Q0, uh, we cannot measure the data at Q0 because that's the direction of the, the direct beam and the, and the intensities there of the direct beam completely uh, dominate the, the signal that you can measure. So we don't actually measure that, but we can extrapolate. So we can measure to as low a Q, low a Q as, as, as we can and then extrapolate what the intensities would be. Uh, and, and, and then you, you can, if everything is well calibrated, you can actually obtain information about the molecular weight of your sample. Um, and of course, there are other, measure, other ways to measure molecular weight, but in solution, uh, that can be important, for example, to determine if you have a dimer or, or a trimer uh, in, in your solution. Now, as Q, if Q is not zero, but it's approaching, so at very small Q, 
uh, or as q tends to zero, if you will. Uh, it can be shown, so if you do an expansion uh, of, of, your, uh, uh, of your exponential, so of your, of your wave function, uh, it, it, you do a Taylor series expansion, basically, uh, you'll get exponentials that are a function of q, and, if, uh, and as q is smaller and smaller and smaller, it, it reduces to uh, uh, the contribution from this uh, first term, and your intensity will be proportional to your forward scattering intensity uh, and to this exponential that you see there. Um, and this is valid at least for, it depends on the shape of the, the validity of this, uh, of this equation, depends on the shape of your molecule, but for globular proteins, it's typically valid to, uh, in the range where Q times the radius of gyration is, one point, is smaller than 1.3. Uh, and if you look at this equation, it should be straightforward to see that it's easy to linearize it. So if you apply logs on, on both sides, you get this, uh, <coughs> sorry, this very interesting relationship between intensities and your Q squared. Which, which you can plot directly from your, from your, from your data. Um, and say so you expect a, a, a straight line. And the interesting thing about this straight line or, or this guinea, uh, as we call it, is that the slope will give you the radius of gyration of your particle. So you're measuring information already. Um, and the, the intercept will give you information about this forward scattering intensity, which in turn, as you see on the formula up there, uh, also tells you about the molecular weight information. So there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting information that you can redraw. Now, um, I put some limits there uh, for the Q min and Q max, the, the typical ones at least, uh, <coughs> that are very interesting and that you should try to, to look at. So when you, you're measuring your data, you should try to cover a Q min that goes at least down to pi over D max, so the maximum size of the maximum dimension that you expect for your sample. Um, and the Euro Qmax should uh, also obey this, uh, this uh, rule of thumb, if you will, so that you have enough points to get your, uh, your guinea. Sorry, let me just take a sip of my coffee. All right. So what about this intermediate uh, Q range? So this was at low Q. Now we're looking at sizes that are smaller than the size of your, uh, of your molecule. So here's your deceivingly perfect molecule again, your sphere. Uh, and when you're looking at a resolution that corresponds to smaller sizes, it can also be shown uh, that there will be a Q dependence of your uh, intensities that again Q can be easily linearized. And that brings very interesting information uh, about, the, about this N factor here, which gives us um, information about the shape of our sample. So depending on the type of objects that you have in your sample, and there's a, an illustration there, you can, for example, so if, for example, your object's more like a 1D type of object, you'll see a Q dependence of about minus one. If it's 2D, <coughs> minus two, 3D, minus four. And then there are some intermediate uh, uh, values where you, 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 you can um, characterize what we call the fractal dimension. So you can, uh, you can investigate the types of structures that you have in there, and they could be a mass fractal or uh, a surface uh, fractal. Again, directly from your data and without knowing the exact uh, structure that you have in there, you can uh, get information about the types of structures present. And this is at uh, intermediate Q. If you're a Q that is much larger than the largest dimension of your sample, something very interesting happens as well. So remember we're in what we call this Perot region. Uh, the intensities will be proportional to, uh, we'll have a, a Q to the minus four uh, dependence. And for example, if you have a sphere, like we keep showing you there, uh, we get to, to what we call the parole law where the, the, the form factor is, is proportional to the surface to volume ratio. So again, we can uh, obtain information about, uh, about an important parameter, for which is very important, for example, for industry, and even for the food industry. Um, let's say you have a porous uh, material in your sample, uh, the surface to volume ratio may be very important information that you can measure with, with sounds. And uh, just to show you in the, in, the, in the profile where this is, so the Guinea region, remember, this, this is at lower Q. And then as you uh, go to intermediate Qs and, and higher, uh, you enter the pro region and you have this Q to the minus four dependency. And again, I'm showing, I'm, I'm deceiving you because I'm showing you very perfect, um, very perfect lines. So this is all theoretical for a sphere of say five nanometers, but you would expect a, a, a profile like this. 
Now, depending on the, the shape, so of course you, your sample is not necessarily a sphere. You can have different shapes. Uh, and like I told you, you'll have a different Q dependency. So if you had more of a, a cylinder, you'd see this Q to the minus one uh, dependency before you enter the Q to the minus four. And if you had something like a disc, which has a surface, uh, then you'd see, for example, this Q to the minus two. So, so the, the, the profile of your, just looking at the profile of your intensity versus Q, uh, you, can, uh, you can already infer some characteristics of your sample. Okay, so what can we do with a whole Q range? Um, now, if we, if, we're, if we assume that the Guinea law applies, so let's think again about the, the, the Guinea equation. If you multiply both sides by uh, Q times RG squared, and you divide by I naught. So the reason why we're dividing by I naught is just to normalize so that you can, um, for example, compare your protein solutions at different concentrations. Uh, you get this interesting result. And if you plot it, if you plot this equation, so you can plot this straight from your data, uh, <coughs> you'll get a profile that will immediately tell you something interesting, which is the information about the, the folding of your protein. So for a, a globular protein, it can be shown that we expect a, a peak. So this is this blue line here. You, we expect a peak at about the square root of, of three. Uh, and, you, and this you can, you can easily calculate from the derivative of this equation. And it'll have an intensity of about 1.1. So if, if the Guinea equation is, is not valid or if your protein is not quite globular, there'll be deviations from this behavior. So if your protein is asymmetric, for example, there'll be a deviation to the right, uh, if it's partially unfolded as well, or if it, even a, an intrinsically disordered protein. So you can imagine, for example, heating up your sample and, uh, and watching it unfold, uh, for example, or applying pressure and watching it unfold, or change the pH and watching it unfold. And all this you can do straight directly from your data, even if you don't have a, a structure for it. Okay, what else can you do with the, with the, with the entire Q range, if you will? <laughs> so, going back to the, the formula for your um, for your intensities, so your your intensities um, uh, depend on the form factor, and you can integrate from zero to the, the maximum distance that you expect on your sample, and you can do uh, an indirect uh, Fourier transform, so you can invert this and obtain information about um, what we call the distance distribution function, and, and what is this? Now, mind you, I, I, I say indirect Fourier transform for many reasons. One of them is the fact that we don't measure the entire Q range from zero to infinite. Uh, so there are some approximations that we make when we do this calculation. And also a priori, you have an idea of the Dmax to expect at a maximum distance on your, of your sample. It's a two first approximation. You can say it's twice your RG. But we don't really know this because we don't yet know the, the structure of our sample. That's why we're studying it. So there are assumptions that you make when you do this calculation. It's not a direct calculation from, uh, from your data. But it's still an interesting calculation to do. And I'll show you examples because it gives us uh, basically a histogram of interatomic distances in your, in your sample. So a histogram of the, all potential differences that you'll have in your sample. So you'll get a peak, for example, that will correspond to your RG. And where it crosses uh, a zero, uh, you'll have a, a, you, an estimate of your Dmax, so the maximum dimension of your, of your sample. And this is uh, interesting information because you can relate it to, uh, uh, to structure. Let me show you examples. So this is your data here on the left. And again, I'm deceiving you because I'm just showing you data for perfect shapes. So remember, it'll all be smeared out uh, in, in a real sample. And you'll see that in the, in the tutorial. But if you calculate the P of R, you can see, uh, let's pick an example. So let's say, for example, uh, this dumbbell here in pink, you can see that the P of R reflects the, the two distances, the two major distances present in, in your sample. So again, directly by calculating the, the P of, well, indirectly calculating the P of R, you can get information about, uh, uh, about structure. Okay, so how, how do you use all this to assess your data quality? So how, how do you have a, 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 a semi-qualitative assessment of your data quality? So on your left, you have good data. In the middle, you have some interparticle interference. So it's not necessarily bad data. It just means that there's some uh, interactions between your, uh, your particles. 
and it could be subtle, it could be severe. And then on the right, you have aggregation. And uh, in red, you have very serious uh, aggregation and in purple, uh, not too bad. And again, just to, to, so that you're not too discouraged when you, you measure SANS data, very often we're between one of these uh, uh, two conditions. Um, but let's assume you have the three cases. So how do you, how do you know uh, the quality of your, of your data? Well, you can, for example, calculate a guinea. So let's say you calculate a guinea for all of these uh, three cases. Um, if, if you calculate your guinea and you have a dilute sample with no other interactions present, your guinea will be a straight line with no major uh, deviations. It, it'll be pretty obvious and you can calculate a very accurate RT uh, from your data. If you have some interparticle uh, interference, you can see, for example, there's a little downturn, downturn at uh, low Q, and I, I told you that corresponds to some repulsive, repulsive uh, interactions. So you'll get an, an underestimated RG if you use the data in this range. So in this case, you would cut the, the Guinea range to, uh, to lower, lower Q so that you could get, get a, a better estimate. So basically, you wouldn't include the points that deviate. Um, and if you have something more serious like aggregation, you can see how it may not be very obvious. So there's still a fairly good uh, fit, but there, there was an upturn at low Q. And so we obtain a very overestimated uh, RG and it may not be obvious because remember at, at, at the beginning, you don't know what the, the exact RG is. Um, so what can you also use to, to know if you're in this uh, third case and then that if you're overestimating your RG? Well, you can also calculate the, the P of R, so the, the distance distribution. Uh, if you have good data, it should be this, uh, this uh, more or less um, sigmoidal shape, and you can see this asymptotic decay to zero, as you would expect. Uh, now, the, the estimate of Dmax typically, even for good data, has errors on the order of 10 to 20 percent. Um, if you, you have some interparticle interference, um, again, it may not be too obviously obvious because you still have a shape that looks kind of okay. But here you're artificially uh, calculating a small uh, Dmax. And you know that because you, your guinea indicated that there was an issue there. Um, now, in the third case, your guinea didn't indicate anything too drastically wrong, but your Dmax will show it. Because instead of having this asymptotic uh, decay to zero, you have this, uh, this sudden downturn. So that your Dmax uh, here is, is too short. So then you would recalculate your P of R introducing a, a larger uh, Dmax until you get a curve that decays more, uh, more gently to zero. So there are ways in which you can uh, uh, you can assess your your data, and of course you always want to collect complementary data as well uh, to make sure that everything is uh, is consistent and that you you know what you have in your sample. Okay, so let's talk in general about SANS experiments. Um, the sample concentration, so all of these uh, um, analyses that I showed you can be very powerful, but uh, remember that SANS is a very underestimated, uh, uh, so basically the SANS data that you collect uh, is, is typically not uh, two or three or four times more data than you have parameters to determine. Uh, it's a very underestimated uh, um, uh, problem, if you will. So having parameters that you know well and that you know accurately is very important. And one of them is your sample concentration. So you don't want to have errors in your sample concentration. And you can be the most perfect pipetter in the world and the most you can have the best lab techniques and still have uh, um, issues with your sample concentration. So you want to verify it, uh, actually verify the, the concentration of the sample that you're using. So there are many uh, sources of error when you're measuring uh, concentrations, so you want to, to know that parameter accurately. Um, higher concentrations in general are better for, for, for the signal to noise, uh, but we, if you, for example, just want to look at your form factor and you don't want to have structure factors present, you should always do a concentration screening, so a measurement at different concentrations to see when your structure factor starts uh, impacting, uh, impacting your data. Now, uh, if you've never done a SANS experiment and you're wondering how much sample do you need, so typical amounts of sample are about half to one mil, and the concentration can, go, can be anything from one to 10 mg per mil. That depends on the, on the, the scattering, the, the cross section of your sample. But remember that if you're going to use low contrast conditions, so uh, when, when you're going to come closer to the, in, in, in the buffer signal to the signal of your sample, 
the intensities will be lower, so then you might want to use a higher concentration. So think about these things when you're planning an experiment or talk to an instrument scientist and they, they, can, they can also give you a few recommendations. I told you about power dispersity. Uh, it is a problem because the you know sands is a technique that averages the data of everything present. So if you have very poly dispersed samples, you're basically losing resolution. Um, so you use complementary techniques to ensure that you either have a minimal aggregation or that you know what the poly dispersity of your sample is. Uh, check for purity. Um, also remember the the pH and PD effect. So if you're working with uh, uh, with D2O. Uh, there could be shifts in your uh, in your pH that you do not expect, so watch out for those. And uh, also, the solubility of most the biological molecules is reduced in uh, in, uh, in D2O. So the fact that you're working in D2O buffers can also uh, introduce some poly dispersity. Um, think about the sample environment. So what temperature, pressure, pH, and precision will you need? Because this can determine not only if SANS is an appropriate technique to use, but also which instrument or which facility you're going to use. Um, think about how long is this, the sample stable for. So if your sample uh, is only mono dispersed for half an hour after you've done a size exclusion chromatography, uh, it probably means that you should be using SACs instead. So you probably should be using a, a technique that can measure it faster. Um, and for example, if you're using uh, pressure cells, if you're looking at uh, investigating phase diagrams, for example, you may need uh, larger volumes. So the, I think the overall message is that you have to think about all these things, but also my strong recommendation is discuss these things with instrument scientists. Uh, they're happy to discuss it with you uh, and they can alert you for, uh, for different aspects that you, you may not uh, have thought about ahead. Um, now in the tutorial, we're not going to cover, uh, we're not going to do a whole contrast variation experiment. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that, uh, but I wanted to just leave you some software suggestions. Um, you can uh, uh, estimate the contrast, the contrast, sorry, of each component uh, in your sample so that you know what to expect from your experiment. That will also make your proposal stronger if you include this information. So if you uh, do some calculations and you know what to expect, then you, you're less likely to have surprises when you collect your data and you're, you're more likely to have a successful experiment. Um, again, these are suggestions. So there are other types uh, and other uh, software that you can use. But for, if you have a two component uh, complex, you can use uh, mulch, for example, and it will cal uh, calculate the, the, the signal that you should expect from the, the two components. If you have more than two components, you can, for example, use the, the contrast calculator module of SASE, which is another software. I, I'll leave you the references there so you can always look them up. Um, so you can uh, investigate an unlimited number of components and it also gives you the forward scattering intensity uh, as a, a function of the percentage of D2O, which may be also important information uh, to help you know what uh, concentrations you, you're going to want to use. And it's also one of the parameters in your guinea, so you, it'll help you uh, know what to expect. Um, now, if you want, if you have a PDB uh, uh, file available and you want to compare with the, the crystal structure or have an idea of what to expect, again, you can calculate the theoretical uh, SAMS curve. Um, again, emphasis on the theoretical. <laughs> uh, but it will help you, for example, know what Q range uh, you're going to, to, to need to measure. Um, and and uh, both the, mod the SAS calc module of SASE and, and Chrysan will, will do that for you. Uh, this is not, not necessarily straightforward, so you have to add hydrogen to your sample or deuterium. Um, but, uh, but again, just uh, give us a shout if, if you're interested in doing something like this and we can, we can help you out. Um, so just to revise what we've, we've covered, um, we've looked at the SANS experiment and, and hopefully you have a better idea of when you would use it. There are two main reasons why you would use, for example, SANS instead of SACS. Uh, usually it's because you want to do an in situ measurement or you want to use contrast or both. So in situ measurements are very powerful with SANS because it's a non-destructive probe, right? So that you have no radiation level. So if you want to, for example, do a temperature screening, see how your sample uh, reacts to different temperatures, look at hysteresis, um, reversibility of the effects, then you, you're going to want to use SANS. Or if you need contrast, if your SACS, for example, uh, data does not give you enough contrast, uh, you can use labeling to, to, um, to increase the contrast or to highlight a certain component. Let's say you have two proteins, you want to see how they, uh, how they complex together, what are their structures, then you can deuterate one of them and then, uh, and then highlight the two um, structures in turn. 
we looked at the sands uh, scattering process a little bit and I and I told you about this magical formula and I I've tried to introduce to you the the notion that what we measure typically is an effective or an apparent uh, structure factor but there are approximations we can use so there's this beta approximation that we can use to take into account the fact that your your sample is not necessarily a uh, a sphere with uh, you, uh, isotropic interactions in all directions, regardless of its orientation. Um, and I also told you about the interaction potentials that uh, we plug into the calculation of the structure factor. So remember, SANS can not only measure a structure, but it can also measure the interactions between different types of molecules. Uh, and it gives you information about the types of interactions at, at stake. Uh, and in the, during the tutorial, we're going to work on this a little bit. You're going to, to um, fit your data with some structure factors and you will see the effects of this. We've, we've looked a bit at, about uh, the different types of analyses that you can do. So at low Q, you can have your guinea, you can have your PR and your Kratky. And the powerful thing about the, these three uh, is that even though, for example, the guinea is look completely a model independent uh, approach, but you don't need to know much about your sample a priori to do these analyses. So you can you can um, get a lot of information from your SANS data, even if you if you don't know too much uh, about your the structure of your model. Uh, and finally, you looked at the data quality a little bit. We we spoke uh, very broadly about how you'd plan your experiment. Um, I didn't tell you too much about uh, labeling, but this is something you will want to consider to increase the the contrast of your of your sample of your uh, data uh, or also to to just look at different components in a complex we spoke about power dispersity um, a little bit uh, and just a final note so uh, uh, as uh, tommy mentioned uh, i work at nist so i at nist we have a, a suite of sands and v sands and u sands with different q ranges uh, of instruments so if you if you want to do an experiment at, at nist uh, just drop me a message or if you have any other questions my, again, a, a sort of a take home message is that you want to talk to instrument scientists if you're thinking about doing a SANS experiment, or even if you're wondering if SANS is the technique that you want to do, just, uh, just reach out to instrument scientists because they're, they're, um, they're glad to talk to you and they, they can at least give you some pointers on, uh, on what to expect and what you would need. And with that, I think I am done. I don't know if you have any questions. for Susanna. See, no questions. So I'll give you the, the copy of these uh, slides so that you can sort of digest the information. <laughs> Uh, in your own time, and if if afterwards you also have uh, questions uh, as you look at the at the slides with more time, uh, you can also drop me an email, but uh, or discuss during the tutorials if you want. Yeah. So so how do you want to go about with um, exercises now? Uh, so uh, so we have some. Uh, hopefully you, you saw that there's some data um, that you can use. Uh, there's, you'll see in the in the link that as a, as I showed you uh, as I sent that, that there's um, there are four data files that you will see there. So there's uh, <coughs> two sets of data in the dilute and concentrated uh, regime, and uh, and it's uh, in the presence of salt and in the absence of salt. So that's sort of a, a typical uh, protein solution sample that you'd have. Uh, and the basic idea there was to give you data that is realistic. So uh, lysozyme is very well known, and most people think it's very well behaved, very very well characterized. Um, and the idea of using lysozyme data was to sh actually show you how even a very well known, tip supposedly well behaved uh, sample uh, can give you problems, uh, and how the data is not that perfect, uh, very uh, high resolution, well defined profile. Uh, that you might expect so that so to give you a, a more realistic idea of what uh, uh, of what you can come across when you when you have your sense data and how we how we, we deal with it how we analyze it and how we fit it so uh, so that data is in that folder hopefully you've downloaded it um, if you haven't you can maybe do it uh, uh, soon <laughs> and I wish uh, and there are also two pdfs in there so one one pdf uh, uh, is called information and it just tells you how the data was collected and what's your sample. 
so uh, think important things like the temperature and, and Q range and, and all that. Um, and then the second folder has a step-by-step -step instruction uh, on how to fit the data. So basically what we're going to do in the tutorial. Now in the tutorial, I will first give you a, a little demo. Uh, so I'll if you've never used SAS view, you, you, when you open it, you, you might be a bit lost. There are some online videos that can help you, but I'll give you like a crash course <laughs> of how to uh, put data in there and how to start fitting. So I, sh I will show you that for a sample. And then the idea is that you follow this step-by-step uh, -step instruction uh, and then you try on the other samples on your on your own, and I'll be there, and you can just uh, tell me if you get uh, if you get stuck. Uh, if that sounds like a plan. Okay. I okay. Should we take a little bit? Oh, uh, here's from Helen. I cannot find a folder with the data. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Uh, I think that us. Well, I can send, uh, hold on, hold on. I'll fix that right away. Uh, okay. Let me stop sharing for a second. I can write that in the, here's a link uh, in the chat now to the Indico page. And if you go to the Indico page under timetable, uh, and then today's exercise and that there's the material that I received uh, from Susanna. Mm -hmm. Plus that there was one document that was in the um, email that I sent out with, with uh, all the intro information, mm -hmm. Zoom info for, for the entire week. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm... Uh... Is that okay, Helen, or? Yeah, I mean, I, I just, because you said under exercise, it would be, or? Uh, yeah, I don't remember if I put it under the- It's, it's, it's like, a, there is like a paper clip. And yeah, can, there's a paper clip, like an attachment. Picture, you can download them. I can also email it to you if it's easier. Uh, it's not a huge yeah. file. Uh, I see paper clip on some of these, but not on. There is one on the exercise uh, on Susanna. Yeah, yeah. There's a paper clip, and then there's four sub documents that are with the ending sub, and then there's two. Oh. Yep. Sorry, I was in the wrong day. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's okay. Okay. In the meantime, can I ask some questions? Um, the first question, I don't understand why the plane wavelengths after they meet this uh, spot and then they become circles. Okay, <clears throat> let me share that again. Mm -hmm. oh, let me share. Can you see it? So this part, right? Uh, yes. Let me make that yes. a little bit bigger. Um, so basically, don't get too, too worried about this. This is basically just a representation of how we interpret <laughs> uh, the the data. But um, I don't. I think Frank actually showed you an image uh, of a beach, right, where you see a, um, a, a sort of a, a, plan, a wave coming up to to a beach, and then you, you'd have some point interactions. Um, with the uh, with some spacings and then it, it, you'd, you'd see the effects of uh, uh, it, it's a shame I don't have that image here but basically you you, you can think of your incoming neutron uh, so your, your neutron is a particle but it's also a wave right so you can think of your incoming neutron as um, as a plane wave and you can imagine imagine what you would get imagine if this is water what you would get is, is this plane wave hits a point if you will then the, the results is, is a, 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 a wave or a, a change in momentum that we interpret as a, as a, a scattered wave, uh, because that's, the, that's where we can measure the, the, the results, basically. That's how we interpret it. Um, I don't know if I have that image here. Um, it's just a, a way in which we interpret it. And it's also, a, um, it comes from the fact that the, the wavelength 
uh, of the neutron is so much larger. So it's, it's a factor of four, right? Larger than the size of the nucleus that, it, that it's going to interact with. So, it's, so for the, the neutrons, the, it's as if the nucleus was a, a point scatterer, right? Uh, it's different, for example, from, from X-rays where the interaction is with the electron density cloud, uh, which is much, much larger than the, the, the size of the, of the nucleus. Have a look at, um, if you want to have a more uh, intuitive or visual idea, if you want, have a look at in Frank's, uh, I believe it's in Frank's presentation. Otherwise, drop me a message and I can, I can send you that. Uh, he has this image of a, of a beach where you see the, the incoming waves that you can think of as, as you know, plane waves. And there's um, a sort of a wall just before the beach with some openings, and you can see the effect of the of the the, the interaction on the beach. So you can see these the tops of the spherical spherical waves. That'll give you a more um, um, intuitive feeling about the, the type of interaction. But basically, it's just the way how we interpret it, right? It's just the, the mathematical treatment that we use. Yeah, thank you. And then second question. So you talked about a lot of pa parameters we can get from this mm -hmm. sense experiment. Uh, the molecular weight, um, radius of gyration, mm -hmm. surface volume, vector structure, and are there any other parameters we can get? Or these are all? So you can, um, you can infer a lot of uh, a lot of uh, information. So the other important parameter is um, the the types of, of uh, interactions that you have, and this is also a very powerful thing about sense. So, so not only structure, but we're also measuring um, uh, types of interactions between different molecules uh, in your sample, which is is very important in the, in biology because it controls how the sample behaves, right? Uh, so, for example, it, it, the, the reason why you have aggregation or do not have aggregation is because of the types of interactions that you have between your molecules. Um, yeah. So, for example, for a formulation, this is, uh, this is critical, or for the behavior in terms of phases of your, of your sample. And again, because, because we can look at, uh, uh, we're not limited to solutions. I keep giving this example of solutions, but we are not limited to solutions. Uh, neutrons are very penetrating matter. Uh, so we can look at dilute solutions, but we can also look at concentration, concentrated solutions, and we can look at, uh, at a powder, we can look at a solid. Um, so, th so there's a, a broad range of, uh, of applications there. And that example, yeah, I remember you also say that we can also get concentration. Mm -hmm. So, no, sorry, no, concentration, um, you cannot directly get that. So that we, we expect that you know that about your, your sample. Uh, if you're, you can get molecular weight information if your data is well calibrated, uh, and typically we do that by measuring a, um, a second sample data on a second sample, for which you know already the molecular weight with accuracy, and for which you you've carefully measured the 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 concentration. So we can ca actually calibrate our data to get uh, a semi-accurate uh, measurement of, of your molecular weight, which is interesting. For example, if you have uh, if you want to know if you have a dimer or a trimer, um, so what type of size of molecule you have in, in the solution. But, uh, but SANS is not the technique to, to, to measure concentration, not really. Then you should use other techniques to, to get more accurate information about that. So in fact, you should come into a SANS experiment with as, as much accurate information as possible um, from a range of techniques. So you, you should know the purity of your sample, you should know the percentage of deterioration, you should know the concentration, uh, an average size, uh, what to expect. Uh, so you should, you should come into your experiment with, the, with as much information as, as possible. And, and again, because there are a lot of parameters and, and uh, to determine and, and comparatively not much data from SANS, if you want to have a, a, an accurate answer to your, to your experiment, uh, you, you need to use complementary information so that you have a, a, a full story. Because it is possible to fit a, a sans curve with the wrong model. And you can have a very nice uh, fit, but you, and the model be wrong. <laughs> so you need to, to, you need to know that that model makes sense for your, uh, for your sample. Yes, and last question. What is this sense, the difference between the sense and neutron reflectometry? Okay, so in the... In re you can almost think of reflectometry as a as a, a specific case of SANS, where you have your your uh, your um, your molecules aligned uh, or or structured in a in a surface. Okay, 
So in, in that case, you're, you're looking at a, a, a surface or a, in, and at the orientation of a molecule in, in a surface. So the, the type of sample and the, and the experimental setup is, uh, is different. So you'd be looking, for example, at, uh, uh, at how a molecule binds to a membrane. Uh, that's a very common application of, of uh, reflectometry. So you're looking at reflections, right? So you're looking at, the, at some surface of interest which will be, for example, a membrane. So for example, if you wanted to know um, uh, the orientation of, of a protein that binds to a membrane, how does it orient when it comes into that, uh, to that surface, then you would use reflectometry, uh, just to give you an, an example. Uh, in solutions, because it's all, uh, the molecule is tumbling in solution, it's all averaged, uh, you would not get uh, that sort of information. Okay, thanks. So the resolution is actually higher. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you can see my screen. Yes, we can see SAS view on it. Okay, fantastic. Right, so shall we get started? So hopefully you've downloaded the data. It should be four files. Um, they're not very large files. Um, and you'll see uh, one is called one lice. The other one is a hundred lice. And then there's one lysed NaCl and 100 lysed NaCl. So they're in pairs. There's a dilute and a concentrated solution uh, that were uh, prepared in just T2O buffer. Uh, and then a dilute and concentration solution that were prepared in the presence of 150 millimolar of salt. Okay. Um, so if you've never used a, a SAS view before, uh, I don't know if you have it open, um, but if you do, you will see that on your left, there is uh, uh, what we call the data explorer. So this is where you sort of manage your data, where you load your data, uh, and where you tell the program what you want to do with it. There are different options at the bottom here um, that we'll get to in a second. And then you'll have a, a fit panel on your, on your right where you control, where you're going to control your fits. So the first uh, step, the first thing you do is you load your data. And, uh, I don't know if you can see the mouse, but you do it uh, here, where it says load data. Um, and if, if at some point you cannot, so I'm just going to give you a little demo, demo now, and then you will try it on your own. Uh, if at some point you cannot follow, you cannot click and do exactly the same things, don't worry, just look at what I'm doing, because afterwards you, you're going to do it on your own. Uh, and you have that file that gives you the step-by-step -step instructions and, and it has a little print screen so you'll know what to expect. So you will be able to do it uh, on your own and I'll be here as well if you get stuck. But if at some point you're, you can't follow, don't worry, just uh, look at what I'm doing and, and then you're gonna have time to do it on your own. Okay, so let's load the data. There are these uh, dot sub. Uh, sub is for subtracted because we've subtracted our background. So we're gonna load that and you can load uh, all of them in one go because you can choose which one you're going to look at uh, first. So they're all there. Uh, and one thing you have to uh, be careful when you're uh, using SAS view uh, is that it, it very often by default selects data and you, you, you want to decide which, one, which, which data you're going to look at. Uh, so to make sure that you don't have some, some, some of these data files clicked uh, by mistake, uh, I always start by uh, going here where it says uh, select and I go unselect all so that I then have to specifically go and click on the one that I want to look at, right? So that nothing is clicked by mistake. Uh, and you can see if you press the little plus here that you can open uh, information about the data and, uh, and you'll have the, your data there and fit results once we have some, some fits will be listed there as well. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to this in a second. So let's start uh, with this uh, one lysozyme sub. So I'll do it for I'll do the, the the fits for this one, and then you can work on on the other ones on your own. Uh, I'm going to click here, and I'm going to send the data to fitting. So there are different options depending on what you want to do. So if you were going, to, for example, to calculate the p of r, you'd send it to inversion. Uh, I didn't tell you about this invariant option, but you can also do a calculation. Uh, if you're invariant, you can do a fitting, you can do correlation functions, there are different options. We're going to focus on the fitting option here. So I'm going to send the data to fitting. Okay, and you can see that this, uh, this uh, fit panel now becomes active 
and it says data loaded from one lives dot sub. So you know that this is the, the data that you're fitting. And you can see that you have different tabs. So you have model, fit options, and resolution. Here is where you decide which model you're going to use. Um, I'm just going to have my step-by-step -step guide here so that I follow more or less the same steps as what I'm going to tell you in the, in the guide. But um, we're going to, so this is life assigned data. And I'm going to assume that you don't have the PDB structure available, which is often the case when you're looking at a new structure. But let's say that we, we kind of know that it's, or we expect it to be a sort of an ellipsoid shape. So not a perfect cir circular shape, but an ellipsoid. So we choose ellipsoid. Uh, now SASView has a, uh, a number of models already loaded onto it. So you can, uh, at least to a first approximation, uh, you can load these to, to, to see how it fits your data. And then if you need a more specific model or if you want to do your own, uh, there are also options to, um, to, uh, uh, to introduce your own model. Uh, and it's not too difficult. And, uh, and again, if you, uh, if you don't know how to do this, uh, just uh, give us a shout because uh, the developers are very responsive and they can help you do that. Uh, and at least once a year, we have a um, um, sort of a, a hackathon where we try to help people um, uh, do some modeling. So, okay, so we chose the category. We said it's an ellipsoid. Uh, and the model name is going to be ellipsoid again. And you see that it populates a number of parameters and you can sort of uh, change the thickness of the column so you can read it all. Okay, so remember that magic formula that I kept showing you that the intensity is proportional to the volume fraction, to the form factor, to the structure, structure factor, and there's a background. So this all comes back here uh, in your fittings. So you have a scale here, which is your volume fraction. Background, that's the background of your data. Scattering length density of your molecule here, scattering length density of your solvent. And because we have an ellipsoidal model, you have a polar radius and you have an equatorial radius, okay? So for scale, uh, it's the volume fraction. Our, our solution is one mit per mil. So that corresponds to a volume fraction of, so it's 0.1%, right? So it's 0.001. Um, so uh, watch out for the units. The units are here on this uh, last column. Uh, the value of the parameter is on this one, and then you have a minimum and a maximum. So if you if you have a range that you expect the parameter to fall, you can also introduce that here. Otherwise, you just leave it uh, as, as default if you really don't know. Now, um, when you tick on one of these options, it'll it'll fit that parameter. If it's not ticked, then it will not fit the parameter. So for example, if you know the volume fraction and you're sure of it, so you know that it's one meg per mil, you've measured it, you've confirmed, you do not want to fit this parameter ever, then you can uh, right click and constrain it to its current value so that you don't leave it ticked by mistake. So that's just a little, a little trick that you can use. Um, now your background, I told you that the data has background subtracted. So to first approximation, let's set it to zero now. Um, the scattering length density of your protein. Now, a priori, you don't know it, but I, I gave you a few links for software that you can use to get a, a, a rough um, estimation of what to expect. Uh, and if you had used it like, for lysosome, you would get to a value that it's approximate 3.4 times 10 to the minus six. So it's already times 10 to the minus six here on the units. So you just put in 3.4. Solvent is D2O, so it's, 6.4 times 10 to the minus six. And again, you can find that in the literature, but you could also calculate it very easily. And then you have this uh, ellipsoidal uh, polar and equatorial uh, radius. And for a lysozyme, and I give you that in the instructions, uh, for a first approximation, you're gonna leave that at 20, and you're gonna put the equatorial one at 10, just as a first uh, starting parameter. Um, and I'm gonna tick the polar radius. I'm going to say that I want uh, to have a look at that one. So it'll be the only parameter that it will fit. So you just click on show plots just so that you can see what the data looks like. So you have your data here in blue and your orange, you have this, uh, the, what the, the fit or the, the model would look like. So it hasn't calculated a fit yet. This is just the, the calculation that it has done from the parameters that have input. Now, another uh, interesting thing as well and important is uh, what, what is the Q range that you're going to fit? Um, 
So if you look at your data, you can see that you have a very, very strong upturn here. And this is one micromil uh, lysosome, so you don't expect uh, aggregation. <clears throat> Although it's, it's still possible, but you don't expect it necessarily. Uh, and then you have its very noisy data because it's not a very, uh, it's a very dilute sample. This, the protein is not very large, so it doesn't have a very strong uh, cross section. Uh, and then it gets noisy again as, you, as it flattens up towards the background. And again, like I promised you, I did not uh, give you very beautiful, perfect data. I gave you realistic data where, where you'd, uh, you'd have to deal with these things. <laughs> so it, it's, it's kind of noisy data as you would expect for a, for a very dilute, uh, small protein uh, solution. And when you're going to do your fit, you have to decide which Q range you're going to use. Now, I don't know what happened there. My guess is that there's probably air bubbles uh, in the solution. So it's, it's contributing to this uh, low Q regime because we're only at one mil per mil, so I didn't expect uh, aggregation. And then it gets noisy here again as it, as it flattens out to the, to the background. So I don't want to fit the data, including this part here at low Q and, uh, and this noisy part in the, in the high Q. So you go to the second tab that's called fit options. And we're going to limit the, oh, sorry, the Q range to 0.01 and then up to 0.4. Okay, and you can you can see that this uh, this fit line is now much shorter. So we're going to try and fit only in this uh, range defined by the two black uh, lines. So we click. Uh, oh, sorry. And at the bottom here, you have the residuals. So the residuals are simply the difference between the 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 model, the orange curve that you see there, and your uh, uh, and your data, and you also see here on the on the fit panel, there's a little fitting error. This chi square here. This is a reduced chi square, so you want it to be uh, as low as possible. So it's it's basically your regular uh, uh, chi square. Chi, you can fit, think of it as a Gunnarsson -sub fit, if you will. It's basically your regular chi square, and if you hover, it gives you the the definition. Um, it's actually weighed by the number of uh, uh, points and the number of parameters you're trying to fit. So if you tick on more options, it'll 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 be fitting more parameters, and this will affect the calculation of your chi square. But you want this to be, well, ideally zero, but uh, as low as possible. Okay, so I'm going to click on fit, and you can see that it adjusts the curve, so it's trying to, to fit the data, and it's not yet quite uh, perfect. It's kind of okay, but not perfect. Um, so things that you can do, you can say, well, I don't think the background is exactly zero, so let's try and fit the background. Um, now, one thing to be careful when you're doing these fits is that these parameters are often correlated. And you can see that SASView actually separates the scale in the background from your uh, uh, very specific model um, uh, parameters. Uh, and it also, so remember that magic formula, your intensities, you have your, your volume fraction, uh, so your scale in this case that is being multiplied by uh, by your form factor and your structure factor. So if you if you change the scale and you change one of these parameters at the same time, they're correlated. So you can bias your uh, your results. So you don't want to fit too many parameters at the same time. So you can, for example, untick the polar radius here and fit your background and let it find more appropriate values. So that looks a little bit better. Um, and now we can go back to our polar radius, for example, and fit again. And okay, and then we can say, okay, this is a sort of, a, you could say this is okay. It's a, a reasonable fit for, for this quality of data. But remember, I told you that you, you need to know what to expect and if the fit is reasonable or not. Uh, and as it so happens, I looked at the PDB structure for lysozyme and I saw that the we don't expect a, a, a um, an ellipsoid ratio, or in other words, a polar to equatorial ratio, to be too large because I, I know that the structure should not have a, a polar radius that is so much larger than the equatorial radius. So then, what the what the step by step guide uh, also tells you is that you should try to change, increase the equatorial radius, which I haven't fitted yet, to a slightly higher value, and try to fit again, so just to, to decrease this ratio a little bit because it's not realistic. Uh, um, given what we know about the structure. So let's fit that again and see what happens. Now the chi-square has dropped significantly, so I, I, I trust this much better. And I can also visually see that it fits the data much better. Um, so we don't need to click the, click the box. Sorry? We don't need to click the box if we want to fit the this one radius of the last Maybe. one. 
the equatorial? No. So yeah. what I did is I changed it manually, oh. but I did I kept it fixed. And then I, I left the other one tick to see if by increasing this one, the, the ratio would look more like what I what I expected or what, what I know from the lysosome structure. Okay. So imagine you had a very uh, large macromolecular complex. You had done, for example, EM. So you know the aspect ratio more or less of, of your molecule. Uh, if the result that you're getting here doesn't make sense, then you can you can change this by hand to see if you get something that is more consistent with the information you do have already. So and and it does change. Uh, so it's now more like a ratio of two, which is more consistent with what we know, and and also the the fit to the data is better and the chi-square is also better. But I didn't, so I manually changed this one but kept it fixed. I only fitted the, the second one. Sorry, right. so now, do, do you mind saying the numbers again because your screen is so small that I don't see it. Oh, sorry. So the, the it, it'll be in your, uh, in your instructions but I'll, I'll say it again. So in the polar radius, it now fits to 22.1. And the equatorial radius, I changed it to 12. It was 10 before. So I increased it slightly to see how it would affect the other radius. I, I changed it to 12, and then it fit to 22.1 instead of 20. And the chi-square now dropped to 0.65. Yeah, I don't get a chi-square. Do you get it here at the bottom? I don't know if you see the mouse so, uh, so on the finger. Yeah, yeah I Is don't it? get any number there. It's just like the um, line um but i can look through the tutorial maybe do you have so something awesome. do you have a, an option one of these parameters is ticked so if no parameter is ticked then you won't get a, a chi square you have yeah, to have I take the the second to last one under ellipsoid hmm. and you see your data there plotted um if i Click the show plot, I guess. I mean, I don't get the, I get the upper one, but it looks a bit strange. I don't have like the black lines. I don't have those and it's entirely orange. It's no blue. Okay, so what that means is that your data is not loaded. Uh, so check in this uh, data explorer window on the left. Um, so what you can do is, uh, is basically start over. Go to the data explorer uh, level on the left and click unselect all so okay. that you're sure nothing's ticked by mistake. And then click on the one lysosome. So it's the one lysosome dot sub. Mm -hmm. So yeah, click on that one, that is one click. and only that one. And then click on send data to fitting at the bottom here on the. Yeah. So it should open a tab on your fit panel. Right. It'll, it'll open a second one, probably called Fit Page Two, right? And then you again you select your models. See, uh, so on your tab on the Fit panel, it should say data loaded from, and it should then say one lies up on the on the on the header of that tab. That means your data is loaded. Mm -hmm. And then if you click Show okay. Plot, then it goes. You got it. Uh, no, there is something, um, it requires some kind of command or tool, so I'm going to install that first. I don't know if something okay, so went tell wrong you when I so installed the... Let, let's do it like this. I'm going to go on with, with the demo, and then, and then when I stop and while the others yeah. try to do their own, um, I'll, you can share your screen with me, and we can, we can try to do it step by step. Okay. Okay. All right. So we've got uh, we've got that. Um, so you're gonna have to trust me for a while, <laughs> for now, uh, even if you don't see it yet on your on your computer. So we have a, a an okay uh, uh, fit for a form factor. Now the residuals that you see here at the bottom, like I told you, they're just a difference uh, between the the fit and your <clears throat> and your data. Uh, and you expect it to be so they're uh, they're uh, uh, plotted uh, in terms of uh, um, a number of standard deviations away, away from the mean, and you don't want them to be uh, much larger than plus or minus three standard deviations, okay? So this looks kind of normal. Uh, that's what you would, you would expect pretty much. Okay, 
So now just to show you uh, how to also model the structure factor. Now for this solution, we're at uh, one mg per mil, so we don't expect uh, much contribution uh, from a structure factor. Uh, I will just show you something. So let me just show you uh, the one and the 100. So if, if it's too small you, and you cannot see, I'm clicking on the one lies dot sub and one the 100 lies dot sub here on the um, Explorer panel. And where it says plot, I'm going to create a new plot. So I'm just going to look at the, the two data sets uh, for the no salt concentration. Uh, hopefully you see this, uh, this curve that just popped up. So the one lies is the blue data and then uh, 100 mix per mil, you can see that the, the data is much, much better quality, much stronger. Um, and you get this interaction peak that you see here. So now definitely there's, you know, we don't come up to a plateau at, the, at low Q, there's definitely some uh, interaction presence. So, that you, so you definitely want to want to uh, uh, fit a structure factor to this data set. For the one mix per mil, apart from this, uh, this uh, strange area here that I think comes from air bubbles, you wouldn't expect so much of a structure factor, but we're going to see, we're going to verify that. Uh, and I'm going to show you that for the, for the one mg per mil, just so you, you, you see how you do it. Um, okay. So let's go back to our fitting panel. Uh, we chose a category model of ellipsoid. We chose the model name of ellipsoid. Now we're going to choose a, a structure factor. Remember that magical formula? We also multiply the form factor by the structure factor. And in this case, you can see that there are different options so different types of potentials were already loaded into SASView. Uh, they're not all here, but again, if you, if you want one that is not here, we can, we can add that to the program. We're gonna choose uh, this one called Hater MSA. Uh, so here we're assuming that this ellipsoid model uh, is a charged particle uh, and that there will be some Coulomb interactions between the, the, the molecules. Um, Okay, so then a lot of other parameters pop by. So you see here the, 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 the structure factor parameters at the bottom, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, now, if you don't know what the model do, does or what is the, what parameters it's using or what the parameters mean, uh, my strong recommendation uh, before you, you, you dive into the fitting uh, as if it were a black box is you click this help option here and that'll open a, a web page that you probably cannot see but because I'm only sharing the SASB window, but when I clicked it opened a, a web browser for me. Um, and on that web browser, you have a very complete um, documentation on the program. And it will also give you information about the, um, the um, let me just share my screen. Let's see if I can show you that. Uh, let me share. Okay, let me share my entire screen. Maybe that's better. Can you see my browser? Okay, so when I clicked on help, this is what popped up. So then it gives you uh, information about all the different, uh, you know, structure factors, fitting data, and it's quite complete. So you can you can really um, uh, rely on it. And if you, for example, let's say you do a search on hater MSA, let's say I don't know what the structure factor is. You do a little search, you click on it, and it actually explains what each parameter is, what are the units, what's the default value and it will assume, and it then explains what the model is, what, what's it designed for, and very importantly, it gives you references at the bottom. And please do read about the model before you dive into the fitting so that you know, one, if it's appropriate, and two, what's the way to, to apply the model. So for example, let's go back to my SAS view. Uh, hopefully you can kind of see. Uh, for example, in your model, you have a radius effective, you have a volume fraction, a charge, temperature concentration, etc. And if you read the reference, it tells you that when you combine it with a form factor, you should set the scale parameter to one, because remember this scale is a volume fraction, but it's a, a multiplying factor in that magical equation of ours. So we don't want to apply this scale twice. And you see that your structure factor already has a volume fraction parameter of its own, right? So you should set this to one. Again, the reference tells you to do that. This is why it's important to, to read about it. Um, <clears throat> and the background, we're gonna leave it uh, as, as what it was, but you should set it to one and the reason why you should do that, that's why it looks so, so wrong at the moment is because otherwise you'd be applying to volume fractions, right? You'd be multiplying twice. So if I set that to one, 
you can see that it brings it down to a more reasonable value. Now the background, we're going to leave it at what we already fit. It asks you now, what's the structure factor mode and what is this question? So it's, it's asking you, do we just do a, a P of Q times S of Q? And, you know, remember the magical intensity formula or do we apply that beta approximation? And we're going to say, yes, we want to apply that beta approximation because we know, and that's the model that we're using, that we're, we're not going to have perfectly isotropic uh, interactions between the particles because, it, because it's not a perfect sphere. So we're going to use that. And the radius effective, so basically the radius effective is, is the, the radius that the structure factor sees. Uh, so it doesn't, so it, it's, it's kind of a, an average of this polar and equatorial ratios, if you want. And we're going to set that to unconstrained so that we can vary them freely. Um, otherwise, it sets uh, specific uh, relationships between polar and equatorial radius, and, and we may not be able to, to change this too much. OK, so we set that. Uh, radius effective, it's now set to 20. Uh, now, if you have a polar radius of 22 and an equatorial of 12, and again, that's in your instructions as well. If you calculate the volume of this ellipsoid and you work out an average radius, you'd get something around 15. So I'm going to put that as my starting number. And again, you would know this by reading the, the reference. It would tell you how to work with these parameters. Volume fraction, it's one mg per mil. So we expect that to be 0.1%. Now charge, now this model, again, you would know if you read the reference and if you looked at the help and the documentation, uh, this structure factor model is made for, uh, it's not made for very dilute solutions. So it's made for more concentrated solutions where the charge has a, a significant value. But we can um, kind of simulate uh, interactions at this dilute regime if we put a very low charge. So we're going to put it to 0 0.05. Again, don't worry if it's on, it's on your instruction sheet. So if, even if you cannot read it, it will tell you what to put in here. And you can see that just uh, without even trying to fit, just by computing it, it's already closer to your data. Now, in your information sheet, I will tell you that I collected the data at 25 degrees. So we set the temperature to 298K. Salt concentration is zero for this sample. Uh, for the, the, the NACL samples, we have to put 0 0.15 in here. Uh, and this is the dielectric constant of the medium. We're going to approximate that with the one for D2O. Let's put 73. OK. All right. And now let's click just on the effective radius. Oh, sorry. And let's check that the Q range is still what we selected before. It is. Um, just before we, we move on, you can see that there's a, a third tab in here called resolution. So this resolution is basically where you can tell the, the, the program if it's going to use the instrumental smearing or the, the, the smearing on the data caused by the instrument and that information is on your data file or not. And the default is yes, because you should use, um, you should add this smearing to, to your model. I showed you an example. Uh, to of, of how to of the impact of this into your model because otherwise your model is, is a very perfect uh, uniform uh, isotropic shape that is not realistic. Um, okay, so let's go back. We ticked on radius effective. I'm going to click on fit. Okay, we won't see much of a difference because of course I was telling you approximate parameters already, but it's it's done its fit. Um, the chi-square is still pretty low. If you cannot read it, it now reads 0 0.65. Uh, it's pretty good. I could um, do things like try and fit the background, uh, try and refit uh, the, radio, the equatorial and fuller radius. So you could, you could adjust this uh, further and further and look, at the, and look at the effects. For now, uh, I'm just going to click here on the left panel on the Data Explorer. If you, so if you open the option for your, for your data, uh, I'm just going to click unselect all so that um, nothing's clicked by mistake. You can see that now you have fit results in here. So you have this uh, M1. M1 is the, the, the basically the curve for your fit. Uh, and you have the P of Q, so your form factor, and your S of Q, so your structure factor that we've just fitted. And if you want to look at what that looks like, you can click on this uh, S of Q option. And you come to the bottom here and you say, create new plot. And it will show you a plot of your structure factor. And it may look very shocking because it's very dilute and you think, but I don't expect much of a contribution of a, 
of a structure factor. And this is where you have to be a, a little careful um, because it's not showing you a scale here, right? So if you right click and there's an option to look at your structure factor and click on data info, it opens the information on your structure factor. And you'll see on the X column, the Q values and on the Y column, the structure factor values. And you'll see that they're all very close to one. It's 0 0.98 or 99. So they're actually all pretty close to one. It's just the scale of the plot that's making it look very exaggerated, all right? So then what you do before you go on is you right click again, and there is an option that says save points as a file. So we click on that. And I'm going to save it as one lies, let's say SQ. Uh, I had already done this, so let's see if I like to exist already, and I'm gonna save it. Uh, okay, so now I have it there, right? Now, if I was now going to move on to the next sample and fit the next sample, you can close these windows and they don't disappear. The information is still there. But if for, for some reason you close the program by accident or it crashed for some reason, uh, you want to be safe and you want to save your project before you move on to a different sample so you can save it uh, in a location that makes sense to you. I'm going to put it here. And then you can save it as SASU, for example, so that if the program closed by mistake for any reason, you could open it again and you would not lose uh, your fit parameters, okay? So then you'd move on to your to your next sample. And at this point, I'm gonna let you do it on your own. Uh, so again, you have the step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, let me know if you get stuck at some point. So try it for the, for the other samples. It also gives you suggestions of questions and things for you to think about. Uh, and if you don't have time to think about them now, you can always email me and we can discuss. But I think uh, now maybe I can look at Ellen. Hey, hey, yeah, do we, um, do we hit the long telephones here. Yeah. I can hear Tommy. I can hear Tommy. I will listen to Susanna here on the other course. Let me see if I can hear Tommy. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Helen, maybe. So, okay. So, the rest of you can maybe um, so, go on and, and try it. Uh, Oh, um, sorry, let me see if I can mute him. Uh, here, um, uh, uh, there we go. I think I muted him. Sorry about that. So um, I had a little bit of a question. So okay. from what I know about uh, like chi-square values and goodness of fit and their sort of distributions, mm -hmm. an ideal chi-square value should be equal to one. And if we're going to very low chi-square values, like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, we're essentially overfitting. So I wondered if you have some thoughts in that realm of things. So, so in this case, it's the reduced uh, chi-square, so not just the standard chi-square. And it, it will be affected by not only the number of data points that you have, but also the number of um, parameters that you're fitting. So the number of uh, options that you have ticked here when you're fitting your data. So it's it's weight. If you sort of hover the mouse over the, the chi-square, it gives you the formula. But also if you uh, go to help, it will tell you. Um, so in this case, you actually do want it to be, the ideal value would actually be zero. <laughs> but, uh, but you are absolutely right in saying that it's you can overfit. Um, it's extremely easy to overfit uh, uh, SAMS data. And that's why it's important to to have an eye to not go into the fit uh, blindfolded. So, so for example, this is lysosine. I should know that the, the form factor for lysosine should correspond approximately to a certain size of uh, you know. When I, for example, had um, I was obtaining a, for the first fit, I was obtaining a polar radius of thirty something, which was three times bigger than the equatorial radius. But I know that the from the crystal structure, I know that I don't expect that elongated of a, of a particle, it would not make sense for a globular protein, right? So there are things that you should know that so that you can help <laughs> the fit. Uh, most of the times we are overfitting, uh, to be honest, um, but you have to keep an eye on your, on your, on your chi-square um, on the light of how many parameters you're fitting. Uh, the other thing is not to fit parameters that are correlated. So if, when I'm fitting different radii, for example, 
I should not be fit, fitting the, the scale at the same time because it's a multiplic uh, multiplicative factor in that formula, right? In the intensity uh, equation. So if I'm fitting the scale, which is a multiplicative factor in that equation that affects everything in that formula, I should not at the same time be affecting the radius because you can see how you could bias uh, the fit by increasing one and lowering uh, the other. So the possibilities are tremendous, but you do have to be careful about how you do the fits. Um, there is a different option that I did not tell you about yet. So the, the, the fitting algorithm be, behind this is uh, the Levenberg marker uh, 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 algorithm that you, you, you're probably familiar from, uh, from other applications. Uh, it's a gradient descent algorithm, if this makes sense to you. There are other algorithms that we can choose. So we can choose the fit algorithms if you go to the fitting menu. And if you use, for example, a, uh, one called dream, the, the robustness of the fits is much stronger and it also gives you correlations between the different parameters so it can guide you as to what you can and cannot fit at the same time and if you're biasing the fit or not. Uh, the reason why I didn't start with that one is because the fit is much, much slower. <laughs> so it's a lot more robust, but it's much, much slower. So typically, I would start with something like the default algorithm, which is the Levin, Levenberg Markart, which is faster. It gives you a rougher uh, fit. Uh, you can get stuck in a local minimum, but it's at least a good starting point. And once you have some starting values, you could then move on to a more uh, uh, robust uh, algorithm, knowing that you, the same fit will then take maybe 10 minutes instead of seconds, right? Uh, so it's, it would not be your first approximation, but it does give you uh, a lot of uh, extra information about correlations between uh, parameters, about how, how your fit is converging uh, as well. So yeah, so, you, so you're right in saying that you can overfit and, uh, and that's something you have to be careful. That's why I cannot overemphasize to use complementary techniques and come to a sense experiment with some information about your samples and not completely um, un unaware of, of what to expect. Of course, we can have surprises. Maybe your sample is not what you expected, um, but then, there, then you have to justify that well. That, you, know, you, you need some supporting uh, information to know what to expect. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Mm, okay, like hopefully you guys are now going through the fits and trying them out. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, you said something about constraining, uh, how we can define this between the different parameter that we know they are somehow related and how we should use that in SAS view. Okay, so uh, SAS view, uh, are you still seeing my screen, hopefully? Yeah. No. Oh, sorry. No. Um, uh, sorry. Can I stop sharing for some reason? Oh, um, oh, I can see it now. Sorry. Let me reshare. No screen. Can you see it now? Hopefully. Yes. Try and make it bigger. So yeah, so um, SASView tries. So remember that uh, formula. Let me open the page for that formula. Remember the magic formula that I keep telling you about, right? So what we're doing here is we have our data, which is our intensities, uh, and then we're trying to fit the rest, right? So we're introducing uh, as a fixed parameter the, the volume fraction because we think we know what that is. We measure the concentration. So we, we this is kind of your scale factor, if you will. Um, the contrast we input as again as fixed parameters, but we you could refine that. Um, uh, we put in the sc scattering length density of your protein, the scattering length density of your solvent. Um, so we're, we're inputting this contrast parameter as well. We're fitting the form factor as um, as the ellipsoid, and then we're fitting the structure factor as that Hader MSA approximation. Now, as you can see, these are all multiplying factors, right? So if you're your uh, scale that you have there in, in your SAS view is fitted at the same time as, for example, the different radii in your in your form factor. Of course, they're correlated, right? So if you lower your radius but you increase the 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 scale, you you can fit the same intensity, right? So they'll be correlated for sure. But also other parameters like um, the the um, uh, the background uh, will be also affecting. Because it's a, it's a sum, so it'll affect it less, but it will also be affecting uh, how you do your scale. 
And what SASV tries to do is it tries to put on top the, these multiplicative factors, so the ones that will affect your data more strongly uh, and more directly on top, so that you know not to fit these at the same time as if you, as you fit the rest. Um, and but basically, what you it, what it comes down to is knowing that your fit uh, when you're doing your fit, you are applying different parameters on this formula. So any multiplicative uh, 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 parameter will have a strong in in, uh, impact on what you're doing. Uh, your scattering length density as well, again, and it's squared. So if you start fitting your scattering length densities at the same time as you're fitting a scale, uh, your model is going to be all over the place, right? Because you're fitting two parameters where you can increase one and lower the other and get to the same intensity, right? So just to give you a sort of intuitive uh, feeling about what you're doing, you have to, to remember this formula and what you're fitting, right? So while the background, which is a, just a plus B factor that you add here, it'll be less sensitive. Um, so basically that's what it comes down to. But also, again, I recommend click on the help, go on the documentation and look up the reference for, for the models that you're using because they will give you a lot of uh, of comments and recommendations, they will tell you this this model is not uh, uh, will not produce a stable fit. For example, it'll tell you it's not designed for very dilute solutions. Uh, it'll tell you it's not designed for particles that are not charged. So if I had put a zero here, we would not get a, a decent fit at all. Um, so the the reference helps you, and the documentation help you uh, know what you can and cannot do. But beyond that, you should just remember the magic formula. <laughs> Uh, and that if you're using, if you're fitting some multiplicative uh, factor, you should be careful and you should, you should uh, not fit multipl multiplicative factors at the same time. Okay. Uh, just one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, can we constrain some uh, between two different data sets? For example, I have done something integrated, mm -hmm. something uh, hydrogenated, and I know at least the radii should be the same for both. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, so you can. So, so there are options. If you look at the Data Explorer uh, window here on the left, uh, you can see that there's an option to click for batch mode there uh, that I didn't click here. So let's say, for example, uh, we were just fitting a form factor, let's say, for a second now, just to, for sake of an example. We were not going to fit a structure factor. We just want to fit a form factor. And we know, or we presume to know, that the form factor will be the same for the one mg per mil and for the 100 mg per mil uh, data. So we want to fit them both with the same structure factor. So then you would click there, you, you would load the two data sets, and it, that would constrain the fit uh, to have the same values for both. So you can do, uh, you can do constrained fits. Also, you can add, uh, again, uh, we didn't get into it too much, but if you go to the fitting menu, there's an option for constrained or simultaneous fit, where you can define specific uh, constraints that uh, that you want for your model. So I don't know, you may have some information uh, from other techniques, or or you may have a, a hypothesis that you want to test. Uh, so you can, for example, say, I want the um, polar radius to be the same for all the samples, but the equatorial radius can vary between two values. And you could set that up. So you can actually introduce that as, as conditions that you want. Beyond these uh, minimum and maximum values, uh, in your step-by-step uh, -step instructions, I give you uh, an example. So, so for example, this uh, radius effective, I could tell it that I, I never want it to be smaller than, I don't know, two, and I don't never want it to be bigger than 100. So I could set that here and do the fit, and then it will constrain it between these two values as well. So yes, the, the short answer is yes, you can constrain it, not only within the, the one model, but also from between different data sets, you can do that. Thank you. So it is quite, I mean, here I'm just showing you a very general example to give you more of an intuitive feeling of, of how it works, but it does, it's, it's a powerful software. Um, yeah, you can have uh, many options. Thank you so much, Helen here. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, uh, so another practical question. So I'm mm -hmm. looking at the, I, I reinstalled uh, the first view. I don't know what happened. Anyways, um, so now I'm, I'm in the program and I'm under the fifth option menu. And Do you want to share the screen? I, uh, sure. Okay, let me stop sharing. Um. 
Let me see. I think I can. Hopefully it lets you share. Yeah, there we go. There right. we go. Okay. Okay. So it's in the in the tutorial it says to adjust the Q range to 0 0.01. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I oh, let's see. when I'm in the fifth options, I, I get the min, minimum range and maximum range. So which one of these should I? So your minimum range is, is basically your minimum Q. So that one you want to set to 0 0.01. Mm -hmm. And right. then your max to 0.4. So your max range is your maximum Q. Okay, now are you yeah. using a Mac? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so then if you, to <laughs> uh, if you go back to your model, if you go back to your model tab. Uh, yeah. And then uh, let's have a look at your plot. Hopefully it should have limited the, the range. Yeah, there we go. It's between those two black lines at the, the window behind it. Um, you can see the Oh, you want to see the, the plot or? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's the window behind it, uh, behind that, right. uh, yeah. I can try to send you, after this, I can try to send you a, a version for you to test yeah. because some versions of the program work best with, uh, with some, depending on what, what Mac. And are you using Catalina? Oh God, I don't know. It's a very old <laughs> computer. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invest in a new one, but I just haven't uh, <laughs> had the time yet to okay. look into it. Um, but, um, yeah. So basically, now you see on the plot on the right that's your data and your fit, and you see these two black uh, lines. So that's the limits. This one. Uh, you yeah. you can actually drag these lines to this. Uh, in, you know, instead of typing, you can drag them uh, to oh, define okay. the, the yeah. So you, you could increase that if you if you think well actually yeah I could use a little bit more data so you could do that. Okay, we just have you... to be careful not to fit noisy data, but you can you know just to test because you're you're playing with it now you you, you want to see what the right. can do. you could stretch that out. You know. So you will have more data parameters, but uh, but you can see that they're noisier. So it's 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 something you do have to play with when you have your your data. But that's one of the reasons why I wanted to give you realistic data, you know, not a data that has a perfect plateau and that you never wonder where to cut your data because that's not what's going to happen here when you, with your sample, right. um, very probably, <laughs> because yeah. biosamples are temperamental. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then I think um, I'm just going to continue down the tutorial. Okay, so but, you, yeah. yeah. So you got to do work. Fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, um, let me know if, if you get very, very stuck. I can try to send you a previous version of, uh, of SASV that might yeah. work on your computer. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Susanna, I have a, a problem here. The, the, there is some information jumping out. The CC command requires the command line developer tools. Would you like to install the tools now? So I should install that one. Mm. Can you share your screen just so I have a quick look? Yeah. Uh, wait. Can you see? Oh yeah, it's very big. Uh, when did you get this message? When you open? Well, I try to change the background to zero. The value. Oh, uh, at that point. Um, mm, that's not related to the fit. That's a program. I would recommend restarting the program. Okay, thank you. Did you? Uh, I don't know how far you, you had gone, but if you saved your project, you can reopen it afterwards. Okay. Now this this looks like a, a bug. <laughs> um, so the developers of the program, uh, they are constantly introducing new developments. And if you go on the website uh, or drop me a message if you don't know how to do it, uh, you can actually tell them, I'm trying to do this and it's not working. I get this error message and they will fix it for you. Uh, so they can have their, you know, they actually welcome 
uh, comments uh, and they update it all the time. Okay, thank you. They are they they are very happy to hear from you <laughs> at any point. Or if you want to do something that the program cannot do, you can send them a request and they can try to help you. Um, like I said, at least once a year, often twice a year, they they organize a a sort of intensive uh, <laughs> um, you know, code camp where you don't necessarily need to know how to program Python very well. Uh, you can come in and say, I would like to, to introduce this model, or I would like this option that the program doesn't quite do, and they can try to help you to introduce that. And then the idea is that you then they then uh, you know um, include that in the program and it becomes sort of available for everyone. So it's, a, it's sort of a community effort. So all the models that you see in there were developed by someone else and they, they became incorporated and then they're available for, for everyone. And of course, they always refer back to your contribution. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, the, the print screens that, that I did uh, were on my computer. So they're, they're, I, I have a Windows uh, the laptop here. So they may look slightly different on a, on a Mac, but the general options should be there. They should be the, the same. So that it, should, it should look very, very similar on your computer. It does depend on the, on the version of the, on your, for example, if, especially if you're using a Mac on the, the, so the OS. Uh, using. Which version we, you recommend for the Mac? Because um, my graph also look like uh, Helene. Helene showed you her mm -hmm. um, her graph, but it, it also looked like mine. Yes, that's right. So, which version you recommend for this? So, if if you're using a, a Mac and and you haven't updated it for for a while, it may work better with a, a previous version. Tr drop me a message uh, after this uh, with the version that with your Mac version. Okay. And yeah. maybe I can send you a, a an older version of the of SAS view and you can try and see if it works a little bit better. Okay. Okay, thank you. I mean, ideally, if you can obviously update your system, that's always the preferred uh, option because the older versions are not being maintained anymore, right? Uh, but for you know for a temporary solution, then then you can you can try to do that. Hey, Susanna, uh, I just have a comment about this uh, of version as well, because like mm -hmm. I have Windows 10 uh -huh. and I was trying to install the version uh, number five. Yeah. That is, I think it's the one that you were using. Yeah. But uh, it just didn't open at all. It's just up. It started the first pop up and uh, it just uh, didn't start. So I start, I installed it and I had now the version number four. It's a and bit different, was... but I guess it has the same functionality, yeah, it right? It does. So they're, they are constantly updating it. So, uh, so to, give you a, to give you an idea, so version four is not that old. It's just that they, they're updating it so often that, that the, the version numbers move fast. Uh, in February, late February, March, I was still using version four. Um, so it's not that old. <laughs> it's just that they fix little bugs and they improve little things. Uh, so so it, it might look slightly different, but these basic options that I'm telling you about here uh, should be there. Okay, thanks. If not, if there's something you, you need that you cannot find it again, just let, give us a shout. We'll, we'll try okay. and help. Okay, thank you. I have a question also about uh, this. In the tutorial, it says that we're supposed to change the structure factor mode to this p times beta. How mm -hmm. how do I do that in the? Because I also have the version four of Sasu. Okay. Uh, do you want to sh share your screen just so I can see what you're yeah, seeing? Sure. So we can find it. It's it's possible that it's not in there. Which is interesting. Because it looks like in the tutorial, it looks like you just kind of, there's a scroll down menu here. Yeah. Which version? Uh, this is 422. Uh, let me check. It may not have the beta approximation. Oh, okay. 
So if it doesn't have, in, in this case, because we're just approximating with an ellipsoid, um, it won't make a huge difference. Uh, okay. Uh, in, in, in other systems, it would, you know, if it was a big micromolecular complex, it, it, it might. Um, in this case, it would not make a huge difference. So you, you can still carry on just, uh, just using the, so knowing that what you're fitting now is um, a structure factor that assumes uniform isotropic interactions. Um, so your chi-squares might be a little bit worse, a little. Mm. Um, okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, I don't see it there, and it should show up in the, next to the mm. PFU uh, for the version four. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So then I just, know. Mm -hmm. So it was inserted more recently because people ask for it specifically. Ah. And now I just use it uh, all the time because I, I see that the chi squares is, I mean, for this case, it's slightly better. It's not a huge difference. But for larger systems, it really does uh, improve. So if, you're, if your molecule is much larger, you're going you're gonna to want to use it. I'm just going to share while you guys are busy. I'm just going to share some plots so that we can. I'm just going to plot the data so that you can see what the data looks like. So that's the no salt data. I'm just trying to create questions in your mind. And that's the salt data, same molecule. Plots on the right, the solution has salt. Again, one of the things you may want to consider when you're doing a science experiment, how much salt do I put in my buffer? Should be the same molecule, right? You will see in the tutorials that I, I, I put some questions there to teach you, to, to make you wonder about a few things. <laughs> so in case, you, in case you are not, you don't have any questions and you just followed all the steps and everything works, um, I want you to also question the results. So I sort of put some teaser questions in there to make you think about this a little bit. And there may be some, something about this low Q upturn on the one mil per mil data that goes beyond air bubbles, we don't really know. Um, but again, that's something I will leave for you to think about and we can discuss <laughs> at a later point if you like. So one of the things that SASView is, in my view, at least at the moment, not great at, is at producing very pretty plots. It's a, it's a powerful fitting program, but it doesn't produce very nice, pretty publication-like plots. Um, on the other hand, it does let you save everything, you know, the form factor, the structure factor. So you, and you can export that into your favorite, uh, I don't know, Origin, Excel, whatever you use for plots. But uh, yeah. Pretty pictures is not the strong point of SASU. <laughs> you can do robust fitting, but, uh, but for publication, I would uh, export the data and just uh, use a different software.
Thanks, Susanna. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I followed through the, the tutorial, um, kind of doing all of the steps exactly in order. And I have uh, slightly different values for the polar radius mm -hmm. than in the screenshots. Yep. Uh, is that bad? <laughs> uh, no, uh, that is perfectly normal. Uh, so it's, uh, the they probably, you know, because in this case, we're not fitting a lot of parameters and we fixed a lot of them. So they probably will not be too different, uh, but it is a, a fit and the, the, the algorithm does randomize the parameters. So it's, it's sort of, it's like doing an annealing. It randomizes the parameters and then it tries to make them converge. So you do expect to not have exactly the same results every time. So depending on the order in which you fit the parameters, what you fit first, what you fixed first, you, it is reasonable to, to get slightly different, because uh, it is a convergence, right? It's not a, a straight uh, uh, cal calculation. So that it's because of the way the algorithm works. And if you use even more robust algorithms like Dream, um, so Dream is a, is a population algorithm. So you, you would see even larger differences between fit, one fit to the next, but they should converge to, to similar values uh, within the same chi-square. So not exactly the same as, Normal. Okay, cool. Good question.
<clears throat> okay, so we have, I think, 15 minutes left. Um, so I think I'd like to take a little bit of time, even if you have not finished, I'd like to take a little bit of time just to discuss uh, the data and the fits a little bit. Um, so I realized I didn't show you how to, uh, how to obtain CRAD keys and PFRs and guineas with SASVIEW. Now the reason why I haven't done that is because if you look on the SASVIEW uh, website, they actually have video tutorials and PDFs, detailed PDFs on, on how to use these different options. So you can, uh, you can use them later uh, if you'd like. Uh, but I can quickly show you. So here on this uh, plot, I just plotted the 100 micromil data with, for the salt and no salt in the same, on the same plot. Uh, and I, just to quickly show you how to do, to do for example, a craft key, if you right click on a plot, uh, there's an option called change scale. And if you click on that, uh, then you can customize what you're plotting in X and Y. And there are some preset plots and one of them is a guinea, the other one's a pro, and for example, the Krat key, uh, I'm gonna select Krat keys just because it's easy to read, then it immediately shows you the Krat key plot. Uh, so that so we know that a 100 mix per mil for both samples, the protein is, uh, is nicely folded. Uh, and this is not the normalized Krat key, so here you don't have the Q times RG square, you just have the, the Q, and the intensities is not, are not divided by I naught, so it's not normalized, and that's why you see differences in the intensities here. So what this is telling us is two things. Um, one is that uh, one sample uh, is uh, slightly more compact than the other, uh, and also the concentrations are different, so the intensities of the, of the peak are, are different. Uh, and, uh, and that, of course, they're well folded because you have this, uh, this nice, uh, nice shape that you expect typical of a, of a globular fit. Um, but yeah, so just to give you a, a quick idea of how you could then go about and change it to, to do a pro, to do a guinea and different things, okay? Another option, especially in the, in the last versions of SASFU, uh, that is not displayed automatically, uh, but you can right click and there's an option at the bottom that says toggle navigation menu. So if you click on that, so it's the very last option when you right click, then these options pop at the bottom. And one of them that I like and I find useful is the zoom. So let's say, let's put this back to our data. Uh, let's do a log log. So say I wanted to sort of zoom in here to see what intensities are there in the background, then I could zoom in here, right? Uh, and then I could change it back. Reset. So you can zoom in and look at different areas of your plot that I, I like. Um, and you can also change how you how you, you display in which areas. You can save the data as well. Um, you can you, you have different different options there that is not shown by default. In the on the older versions, this little um, option for the navigation menu pops up automatically. But on the more recent versions, not necessarily. Okay. So just before we wrap up, I, I put some suggested discussion points uh, in your instructions. And also here, uh, I plotted, so on the left, you have the, the one in 100 mg per mil solutions with no salt present. And on the right, you have the one in 100 mg per mil solutions of lysosine with salt present. I don't know if you already thought a little bit about it. If you look at the two of them, as to why they look different. So let's assume for a second that they're exactly the same concentrations. Why do they look different uh, once you add salt to it? Have you thought about it? Does anyone want to comment a little bit? On the bottom, what I'm plotting here is just the structure factors uh, for the two. Well, salt can interact with like the charges on the protein and like, do a little bit of shielding of the charges from each other. So without salt, I guess there should be more elect electrostatic interactions between the different protein molecules to each other. Exactly. So it's very, it's a very simple thing. So it's just that when you have salt present, uh, the charges of the at the surface of the protein are more shielded by the counter ions in the in the buffer. So they interact a bit less, and the structure factor is is a, a, 
is less strong. So there's less interaction. So there's less contribution of the structure factor. So if for some reason you wanted to study your solution, let's say at 200 mix per mil, uh, and that can happen, for example, people looking at, uh, for example, formulations of antibodies that are sometimes uh, used in pharma at very high concentrations, then you may be interested in knowing what's the behavior of the sample in those conditions. And you don't want to cause too much extra aggregation or you don't want the structure factor to, to completely dominate the scattering of, of, of your, uh, your, your profile, then you could use a little bit more salt, for example. So you can, so think, don't for, forget about the buffer, not just the pH, but also the, the salt that you have in there. Uh, and if you're comparing solutions that are in completely different ionic strengths, you, you may not be comparing apples with apples. So, so it, I kind of did this on purpose, not just, so that you, you saw differences in structure factors, but also so that you thought about uh, the salts that you are using, because it does uh, make a difference. Um, and this model was specifically designed for uh, monovalent ions. That too makes a difference. <laughs> so if you had divalent ions, that, that can be adjusted on the model. And again, if you read the reference, it will tell you how to do this. So you can adjust the parameters to take uh, this into account, but be careful with that too. The type of ions also matters, of course. Um, so there was a, a suggested point of discussion was uh, if you fitted the volume fractions, uh, so the scale in your parameters, um, why was it, for example, less than 0.1 for the 100 mix per mil? I don't know if that's the result that you obtained when you tried your fits. Uh, when I did my fits, um, I ended up having a scale that was less than 0.1, which is what I would expect for the 100 mix per mil. And that will probably happen more for the, the solutions with no salt presence. So why do you think that for the 100 mix per mil solution, when I fit my volume fraction, I ended up having less than one? What do you think happened? Could it be that there's also solvent inside the protein and that's not considered in kind of the volume fraction of your... That's a very good point. So, so your your protein will have solvent filled cavities. It will have also hydrophobic uh, cavities. Um, so the, the the what neutrons are seeing could could look different. Uh, but also, especially in the case uh, that we see here for the no salt condition, uh, if there's some aggregation and if you're not rotating or or um, or agitating, if you want your sample while you're measuring, you could have some some of the the protein precipitating at the bottom while we are measuring. Um, and then the actual, the actual concentration that the neutrons see is not the same. Um, so, so that's not unusual to see. And it's one of the reasons that when I'm measuring uh, scattering data, especially at higher concentrations, uh, I measure the concentration before and after my SANS experiment. So remember, neutrons are non-destructive, so you can recover your sample and you can measure the concentration after your experiment, just to make sure that there was no settling, that, you're not, you know, that your concentration hasn't changed drastically. So that if you're doing a fit and you see something like this, you know if it's a fit, an error of the fit or if it's a genuine, uh, so that if you're, we always say that neutrons do not lie. So neutrons are telling them you exactly what they saw. <laughs> and if what they saw was less of the total amount of sample that you put in, then that's exactly what they would say. So that's probably what it meant that there was some aggregation because we can see it in the structure factor as well. But again, uh, in the information that I give you, I tell you that I measure the concentration uh, after preparing the sample, but I don't think I tell you if I measured it before or after the SANS data collection. And because data collection for neutron scattering, so it's not like SCATS, the data, like SACS, the data collection can take hours easily. Uh, so it's plenty of time for, uh, for uh, the protein to precipitate at the bottom or, or for aggregates or larger aggregates to start settling towards the bottom and, and move out of the beam. Um, now, another point, do you have any questions? Um, if not, another point of discussion that I suggest in there is what would be a better structure factor for the, the higher concentration data, so the 100 mix per mil in 150 millimolar. Uh, have you thought about it? So we chose this Hater MSA structure factor. And if you, if you had clicked on the help, it'll tell, it'll tell you. So this is a structure factor that assumes a charged particle and assumes uh, Coulomb, Coulomb types of, uh, of the interactions. 
but you know your particles but we were just saying that when we have a decent amount of salt in the solution then these um these uh, charges might be shielded somehow by counter ions so what would be a better a better structure factor so what would be your instinct <laughs> If you don't know a lot about structure factors, what you would, and you know, you're just approach, approaching this, you've never looked at structure factors, you don't know what the software has to, to offer, then you can click on the options and it shows you the ones that are already, already preloaded. Uh, and it will show you there's a hard sphere, there's a hater MSA, which is the one we're using now, there's a square well, and there's a sticky hard sphere. So these are the ones that it has available um, at the moment. There are more sophisticated structure factors out there, and, and we could introduce them here. Uh, but these are the four that are available at the moment. And if you don't know what each one of them does, what I strongly recommend is that you press help. And you go and you click on the structure. I hope you see my screen. You click on the structure factor and you look for information about uh, each one of them. So let's try this structure. Thinkers. putting that, the screen that you're working in, in full screen. Oh, sorry. Yes. Oh, it didn't, oh, hang on. Uh, okay. <laughs> does that help? Yes, thank okay. you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you click, oh, it's small again, but let me, I can make it bigger. So if you go on structure factors, sorry, on mine it's maximized. It just doesn't show it very big. Um, so you, you have uh, the different structure factors that it's offering. And if you click, for example, in hard sphere, uh, it'll tell you what it does and it tells you for example that it calculates the structure factor of monodisperse spherical particles interacting through hard sphere interactions so it assumes uncharged particles which may be for the the case where you have the, the salt shielding the charges around your particle your molecule may be acting like a an uncharged or or like a very low charged uh, particle so I would probably try a, a, a hard sphere uh, structure factor for the cases where you have salt. And you can try this on your, on your own time. You can maybe try it. And, you know, instead of using the hater MSA, you could try the hard sphere and see if that improves your, your, your fit. And hopefully it, it, it will for the, the salt case. But again, it, you have to do a little bit of reading about what, what the models uh, do. I mean, you could just try and see what fits, but then you're kind of blind. <laughs> and, you, and you can be unlucky that you fit some, you fit your data and, and it's not and it doesn't make physical sense right so your model has to make physical sense uh, with what you know about your sample uh, and again this was sort of a, a teaser so I, I kind of made you fit something with, that is not ideal uh, there's a, in the suggested discussion I ask you why didn't we choose a hard sphere factor for the zero molar so, sodium chloride uh, case since the 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 the, the the structure factor is not made for very dilute uh, solutions. Uh, and that is why, because we expect some charges. In it. So we know that the, the protein, we know the PI of the protein. So that's something you will know from before your experiment. You will know the PI of your protein. You will have decided what pH you want to use. So you know if you expect your, your molecule to be charged or not. Uh, and you decide how much salt you put in there. So there are a number of things that you already control to some extent. Okay. Do you, I don't know if you have. Other questions? But yeah, try different options. And then if you if you have other questions, you can always drop me a message. Um, I guess one general question, like we're dealing with protein data in this case. Mm -hmm. And if we're lucky enough to be working with a structured protein like lysozyme, there is likely a structure available like from crystallography or cryo-EM or NMR. Mm -hmm. So in what situation would you be fitting these sort of structure factor models with SASU? And in what situation would you rather just feed the PDB into software like Chryson? Mm -hmm. So you can, um, so let's say you had a model from EM, for example, or NMR, you know, you had a model from a, a different technique. Um, you'd probably, so if it's NMR, you'd have an ensemble of structures, so you probably have to use an average 
uh, of your structure, get a PDB, uh, then what would you do? You would add hydrogens to your model if it's not there. If it's NMR, it will be there, but if it's just an X-ray crystallographic structure, it may not be. So remember, you have to add your hydrogens to the model because as we've seen, hydrogen or deuterium make a strong impact into your spectrum profile. Um, then if you, if you just want to do a very rough simulation, you can try to calculate the profile without any further calculations. If you want to do a, a proper simulation, uh, you have to let the structure relax because you're, you're using a, a structure factor from a different technique. Like say, if it was EM, for example, it's probably cryocooled. You know, it was blocked at the surface. So you want to do a, a slight simulation to relax the structure to what you would expect for a solution. And that you can do, Chrysan will do it, uh, Sassy will do it as well. So you, you do need to do a little bit of uh, simulation work. It's not to, if you've never done a simulation, you can probably still do it just following the instructions. And again, you can drop us a message or the, the SASE developers also welcome people contacting them and they, they help you uh, with uh, making it work if you need to, especially if it's a very complicated uh, micromolecular assembly. But you would do that and then you'd, uh, you'd calculate a curve and compare it with this one. Uh, so, so that's the ideal. In some ways, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because it means you ha you have uh, you're going to have to do some simulations to relax the structure and to, to have a, a good starting model for your data. But on the other hand, it's a blessing because you, you have a starting structure, so you don't have to, to do this more crude approximation of, a, let's say it's an ellipsoid, <laughs> which is a very crude approximation. Obviously, we know, we know it's, uh, it's, there's a lot more details in the structure than that. Um, but you don't always want to see that. So maybe you, maybe you kind of already know what the structure is. You just want to look at interactions. And, and MR is not telling you that, and cryoEM is not telling you that. You want to know what types of interactions are going on because you want to stabilize the formulation, for example. Then you'd want to use SAM. So you could, you could still use that starting um, uh, structure, but, uh, but then you, you'd want to use a, a, a fit of your structure factors and, and try to fit your data and try to find out, is this an attractive interaction? Is it a repulsive interaction? Do I need to add more salt? Is it a question of varying the pH? How, how high in concentration can I go before? These interactions contribute too much, so these are questions that you can you can answer with this. Uh, and you can also uh, use uh, more complicated structure factors, which have both attractive and repulsive interactions at different hue ranges. Uh, so you you can get to higher levels of complexity depending on what you're you're doing. But it, but that's the power of, of SANS is that you can look at the structure, but you can also look at interactions between the more. It all it, so I keep repeating myself, but it all depends on what you want. <laughs> what, what are you trying? What question are you trying to, to answer? But yeah, but you can absolutely you can um, uh, use models from uh, from other data. It it'll it will. I'm not going to lie. It'll get more and more complicated as the structures become larger and larger. Uh, and if it gets too complicated, or if you don't have enough data, then you can use these kinds of simplifications, where you just use a more generic uh, uh, model. Because you may not be interested in the in, in those structure per se, just in, in, in the interactions, for example, like we're doing now. Um, so yeah, it, it depends what you want to see, <laughs> as always. Yes, as always. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. I don't know if you have other questions. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so in the tutorial, it says to save um, a couple of times. Do you want mm -hmm. us to send you these files or is no, it that's, for our own sake? Uh, that's more for your own, so that if, the, if you close the program by accident or if you have, a, if you have a, a bug or something and you need to close it and restart so that you don't lose the, the fits that you, you already have. Uh, if, you do have a if you do have a question and you want me to look at something, then it's useful. Uh, to send me the project because then I can more or less see what, what parameters you had and all that. But it's more for you, especially when you're doing a lot of fits. Um, I mean, in this case, we're fitting four samples, but very often you, you, you're going to have 20 samples of different concentrations, uh, lots of different salt concentrations. You're going to have a lot of data loaded onto your SAS view, and it's very frustrating if you've already done 10 fits. Uh, you need to yeah. close the program and then you lose all that. So it's more of a I'm trying to get you into that habit of saving <laughs> your project okay, lots yeah, of times, just to save your work, so that it's not a 
you never know with software, right? So yeah, it's just a good habit to have. Okay. But also if you want to exchange information with your collaborators or ask a question to someone, then you can always, you know, if they have the data and they have the project saved, they can, they can see what you've done. True, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's already five past, so I don't, do not want to rush you, but I think we're going to have to end soon. Uh, again, just drop me a message if you, because you have to digest all this information. <laughs> uh, and, and if you haven't had time to finish, which is perfectly normal, uh, yeah, just do it in your own time. And then if you, if you, if you have other questions that, that you remember in the meantime, just let me know. I'll try to help. I'll do my best. Okay, I don't know if uh, Tony or Tessa are here. I think they may not be back yet. Um, let me just check the schedule. I think you're not supposed to have anything else after, are you? I'll quickly no. check. I think it, after this you are free, so you can uh, can spend the rest of the day playing with Sasvi. <laughs> <laughs> or not <laughs> or you can just take your time and digest the information a little bit because I know the program is intensive uh, let me check the schedule real quick yeah no. okay we still have some time is that right am I right do we still have some time I'm happy to sit here and, and spend more time a I think the schedule officially says 4.30, but... Okay, uh, so we still have some time. I'm, I'm happy to sit here and sit my coffee and wait for questions <laughs> as they arise. So if you want to play with it and get used to it a little bit more. Share my screen again, just in case it's useful. Um, let's see. Yeah, sorry, I lost track of time because it's here, it's only 10 in the morning. <laughs> I'm a bit confused. So if this was live, I would be walking around and peeking over your shoulders. <laughs> yeah, I tried uh, batch peeking and it a little bit crazy. I can hear someone talking uh, at a distance. I don't me? know if it's a question or if it's... Uh, Does you someone have a question? Sorry, the sound's not very strong. It's not a question? Okay. Uh, I have a question. Maybe someone already asked this, but uh, can we copy feeds? Uh, from previous uh, sample to a new sample, or we have to set up each time all these parameters? Um, you do have to set up each time. Uh, so if you've done it before and you saved your project, it, it'll populate uh, the fits that you've done before. But when you're moving from one sample to the other, yeah, you do have to type them in, I believe. I don't think you can. Uh... Often it, it does carry over if you're doing them in a sequence, sometimes it does carry over, but because you have to each time select the category and the model name, it, it does tend to bring it back to default. Um, because it assumes that if you're fitting a different sample, it'll be something different. So it kind of wants you to input that information. 
Um, yeah, so unfortunately, it, yeah, <laughs> typically you have to input those. But if you save your project, you only have to do it once. Um, I don't think there is that option. Good question. Um, I'll ask them, I'll ask the developers to have an option to just import uh, those parameters. They're going to tell me it's a dangerous option to have because then people don't check <laughs> their input values. But but you're right, if you have, I don't know, if you have 50 samples, then it's, it's nice to not have to, to type. And again, here, things like the scattering length density of the protein and the solvent, I gave you the values to, to try. Uh, but these were values that, um, that, you, that you can estimate and that I calculated uh, using other tools. So I used SASE and I calculated what was the SLD that I expected. So I used the PDB and I got this value of 3.4. Uh, in reality, for your sample, you don't know uh, precisely the scattering length density of your um, of your protein because you don't know the structure, you don't know how you know how compact it is or not. Uh, so this can vary uh, a lot. You have an idea, but you can this can vary. So if you're doing a contrast experiment, you, you would want to measure um, experimentally what's the, the the match point of your protein, for example. You would calculate it and put it in your proposal. So you would say, I expect it to be, let's say, thirty percent but then you also measure it. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, this batch mode you showed us, uh, mm -hmm. I tried it and I, I have a version four on Windows 10 because I installed version five couple of weeks ago and I couldn't get it to work. <laughs> So I had to go back to version four, but yeah. it, it didn't work in version four, at least the things you showed uh, for the batch fitting. Uh, um, tell me what, what you're trying to do. So you have different samples? Yeah, Data no, for different... I just tried the, the, the same uh, the same license and I tried to fit okay. one sample and then keep the structure factor for one and add it to the, to the next sample. Mm -hmm. uh, I or at least use the the first sample as an initial parameter for the next one. Yeah, as a reference. But apparently, it didn't work. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I'm really wondering why. It, uh, it could be a, a version issue. Um, or it could be the way. Do you want to share your screen? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can take a quick look. Let me stop sharing. So when I want to add them, I can close this one. I fit the first one, which is here. Oh, okay. Uh, I think, um, I don't remember for version four, but I think that you have to select. So, so let's say you wanted to fit the one lysozyme sodium chloride and the 100 lysozyme sodium chloride. So I, I believe you would have to have them selected both. Um, so let's, yeah, those two, for example, when you, before you click to send to fitting on batch mode. So that it knows it's, it's on batch mode and that those two are associated, I believe. Is that what you did? Uh, yeah, I tried this also. And when I say fit, uh, that's, that's the idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. But they are not, but if I want to have this on a plot, I have to again, uh, plot it again. Uh, yeah, there is an option to, you want to have them plotted on the same plot? Or? Because I cannot see the fit now. For example, now I'm trying to batch fit and I use the first one as a, as a reference or whatever, and then, 
I try this, okay, I say feed, for example, this parameter and nothing changes. But that's that's a different issue. That could be um, because the, the fit is not converging because, you know, the, the, you haven't put uh, approximate parameters in there. So, you know, the equatorial radius is way off. The scale is off. You know, there's a, the SLDs are off. So it may be because it's not converging at all. Um, if you, yeah. It should be showing you, you're right when you say it should be showing you the, the both of them. Is it behind that window? Could it be? Oh, uh, yeah, there you go. It's showing you the two fits. So M1 is for the for the other lysozyme. And so it's on, yeah, that the graph uh, three, I think. Mm -hmm. So it's showing, it's not showing you the, the other data because the, the one lysozyme is the one you're using as a reference, right? Um, it's just showing you the quite chi-square for that one. But it's showing you the line for the other, you know, for the other data. So it takes a bit of getting used to managing all the one. Oh, did it crash? Uh, I just. Oh, you stopped sharing. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I thought. But... <laughs> okay. Thank you. But yeah, so you, you, you need to have um, probably what I would do is um, choose the one you're going to use as a reference and, and do a rough fit, at least with this Levenberg marker uh, algorithm, so that you have approximate uh, values that would work. So that you know it's going to converge, basically. And then use that one to, to, to propagate into the others. It is a more um, computationally demanding calculation because it's trying to fit more things at the same time. Um, so if you don't have a good reason to fit it that way, then don't, uh, because you, you can be imposing things that you shouldn't. <laughs> On the other hand, if you if you do have a good reason, you, you expect I don't know the form factor to be the same for all of them, um, then. Uh, yeah, then, then it's a way to increase the number of the data to parameter ratio, right? Uh, so there are instances where you have good reasons to do that. But ag again, if you're trying to look at some data and it's not working for you for some reason because of a parameter or something, do reach out because the developers do, do want to help. Uh, and it, it might be just some silly thing that, that, that we're overlooking or, or that you didn't see and they, they were, you know, instead of wasting too much time trying to do a fit, uh, if you think that it's, there's a, a bug or there's a format issue, contact them sooner rather than later so that they steer you in the, the right direction. And the other algorithm you mentioned, is it this dream, at least in version 4 call? Is what? Sorry, can you say that? Uh, the other uh, algorithm you said uh, instead dream. of... Dream, yeah. It, it has a bunch of them. So dream is a, it's population-based, so it's, it's a different principle. You are more likely to not get stuck. So, so with the Levenberg marker and for something simple like this, it's perfectly fine. And for, I would say, pretty much any system as a starting point, that's what you would use, right? Uh, it's it's faster. You can check quick quicker if you have a roughly okay fit. Um, if you have, especially if you have a, a more complicated system, you would want to then change the algorithm to to dream. It's more robust. It'll take a while, so it's gonna, you know, it's not gonna be a minute. <laughs> It'll take a while, but then it has a lot of advantages. It's more robust, so it'll, you're more likely to find the real minimum, uh, and uh, and also um, it gives you a lot of extra information on the correlations between parameters. So it shows if they're really randomized or if you're biasing them. So if you're starting, if you if you've been fitting your scale and your radius at the same time, which you shouldn't do. Uh, it'll show you that it'll show you a strong correlation, uh, and some journals uh, when you when you use uh, especially if you use this kind of algorithms will ask you for that. They will they will ask to see that to see so what is what's the correlation between the parameters? Can you show us this? Can you, and so you have that data, and you, if you want to publish the data, you can show that you can see look this is convergent. And I I'm not biased to fit, and, and that's what it is. And you may and you will especially want to show that if your result is something that's a little bit more unusual or unexpected. Um, if you have other complementary data and it's all consistent, then no, one, no one's going to question it. It's, it all makes sense, right? But occasionally, you know, the, your molecule will act differently in solution, or but it will surprise you, and then you want to show that you're not biased and that it's uh, that you, you trust your fit, basically. Uh, so yeah, then you want to use green. But yeah, but you are going to 
set it to fit and walk away from the computer and leave it there for a while. <laughs> it's more robust, but it's going to be slower for sure. Yes, I'm fitting something that it's physical plus bone like my cell plus disc. And when I added, I tried, uh, I, 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 I couldn't get it work on version five. So I get back to version four. Yeah, you can, uh, you have some, uh, when you change the algorithm, you, you, you have some um, options to cha change the number of steps that it does. So you can actually reduce the robustness at least to begin with. So you can make it a little bit less uh, demanding. <laughs> So it'll still output all of those options, but you can reduce the number of steps. You can, there, there are options that you can manipulate a little bit uh, to make it, make it less exhaustive to, so that it doesn't randomize the parameters in such a large space. You can, you can constrain that a little bit. Uh, and so when you have really large uh, systems, you can simplify it a little bit and that will work for most cases. But yeah, but it's still going to be slower for sure. So yeah, start with the default Levenberg marker. Don't, don't go to dream straight away because it'll it'll be frustrating. Uh, you you use that when you're more more confident of your convergence and, and of your model, but not not to be in it. Otherwise, you need a very good computer, and you may or may not have access to it. <laughs> I noticed <laughs> it, sometimes it's it's just uh, crash when it's yeah. put it. Yeah. Now stick to Levenberg marker. No, even Levenberg marker, you can reduce the number of steps. It's, uh, it's going to do, but, um, but yeah, it's a better option to begin with. And of course, use all the information you have from uh, from other data. If you know the volume fraction, you, you, or in other words, fix parameters that you already trust. You don't want to fit to too many parameters at the same time. Yeah, use as much as information as, as you have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you're very curious, I have a, a whole data set of at, at different concentrations of lysozymes. So if you if you're starting up your project and you don't have data to play with, I can send you more. <laughs> and you can do a little simulation if you want. And again, it's real data. It's not perfect data that will look, uh, that will perfectly match your sample. You, you will be asking yourself questions with, about the Q range and why does it fit better or not. But that's kind of the, per I didn't want to give you a, a perfect solution that you, that would make you not ask any questions. Because <laughs> your, your sample is probably not going to be like that. If your sample is more well behaved, then you're probably not going to complain anyway. <laughs> yeah, lysozyme is also not a big protein, so it doesn't have a very large cross section. That's the other question you you can and should ask uh, instrument scientists: uh, What's the, the lowest concentration that they recommend you to use? Because not, not all instruments will be the same, so and not all sources are the same. So ask them, what's the lowest concentration that, you, that, that they recommend? You can see that the one mg per mil data was OK. And you can simulate, again, you can use the software to sim simulate your forward scattering intensity, your I0. Uh, and you can let the instrument scientists know, listen, I calculated, and I can see it's 0.05. <laughs> Is this acceptable, or should it? Would this will this give me enough signal to, no, to noise data in your instrument, or what do you recommend? Uh, and they will give you some advice. Again, don't hesitate because they they want you to collect good data. And, you know, they want your experiment to work, so they're happy when you contact them. They're less happy if you show up with a 0 0.05 mg per mil sample that you'll never get anything out of. Hmm. 
Did you manage to go through all the data? Did everyone sort of finish? Good. I should have given you more than. <laughs> I'm a bit slow, I guess. That's okay. If you start playing with the parameters, you, you can you can see. So obviously, I gave you good starting values, but if you start playing with the parameters, you, you can see that the fits can escape your control very quickly. <laughs> so that should give you a feeling of, of how important it is to to use what you know about the sound. With these tabulated values for cross sections, for absorption and coherent and incoherent, uh, and also with the software that you can use to simulate the, the scattering profile, all these uh, these so these available software uh, packages they simulate coherent scattering, right? So it's not going to be the same as your uh, as your measured profile because your measured profile will have incoherent scattering contributions. It'll have a background. There'll be absorption. So remember that too when you do a simulation. <laughs> you're simulating the coherent scattering. So there'll be other factors contributing that will reduce the, the signal to noise. Would be nice if we could simulate, then we wouldn't need to, to do an experiment if we could simulate the, <laughs> the whole thing. Susanna, I had a slightly off tutorial question <laughs> um, about SASVIEW. Um, in some of my uh, samples that I want to fit in SASVIEW, um, I need to uh, add together models. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, I kind of, as you were saying, with the at least with the structure factor, um, including the structure factor, you already have an issue of... Um, so you have scale in one, one uh, model and then you have volume fraction in another. Um, if you're adding together models, and especially if they are custom models, <laughs> how do you avoid that kind of problem? Um, again, well, it, it depends. So if you're, if you're adding models, so it depends what you're doing. So let's say you're... If you're adding, it depends on what your equation is. It goes on, <laughs> it boils down to your equation. Uh, so, and, and the developers of SASView will help you implement your equation, but they will not tell you what equation to use. So you have to come in with that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you're, if what you're summing is, um, for, let's say you have two form factors in there and you're summing two models um, and there is no interaction between them, then you literally do have a sum and you could and you could refine the different volume fractions so the different contributions of each now in reality very often there's there's a, a cross factor right so, so they're, they're, they're interacting they influence each other so a, a structure factor if you will um, so it's rarely as straightforward as that and mm -hmm. very and very often or almost always you have to refine that you have to refine the, the, the scale factor for the both of them. And also very often you have a, so you have the model for one, the model for another, and then you have a third factor that accounts for the interactions between them, okay? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not independent typically. Um, but uh, again, you, you do your best to try to come up with an, with an equation and you read the literature and you try to come up with a model. Uh, reach out to someone who is on models. <laughs> if you reach, out to, reach out to one of us. Uh, if you come to SASVIEW, to like a, a SASVIEW code camp and you don't have your equation, they probably will not be able to help you. Unless yeah. you talk to someone like, Paul, you know, unless you talk to one of them who also does models like Paul Butler, for example. Uh, yeah, talk to one of us, basically. <laughs> and yeah. they'll try to help you with the equation. What they do help you with is when, you know, if you have the equation and you, you just don't know how to implement it in the, on the software, that, that's straightforward to them. It's not too hard to do. Um, so they will give you advice on uh, how to name your parameters, how to code for it and, and all that. Uh, so uh, 
basic things, also common pitfalls is that you name your parameters the same things as variables that are already defined in the program. You probably came across that already. Uh, so that sort of thing they will help you with. They will not uh, tell you how to do the equation. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that you have to reach out to one of us probably. Mm -hmm. um, but, this but, yeah, but usually you have to refine the scale. Just a little bit of a, um, when you say the interaction between the two models, mm -hmm. um, what do you mean? I don't quite understand what you mean by that. Okay, so... Um, so, so like, I'll, I'll, it probably is easy, I just told you. Um, so like the, um, if I'm looking at with the ones in SASTU, at least combining a core shell model with like a, just like a broad peak Lorentzian uh, to have like a core shell mm -hmm. particle with internal structure, what would be kind of the interactions there? Is it just kind of scattering from? So there are two ways of thinking of this. So the intuitive idea is that they're both present in there. They, they influence each other. But this is the intuitive idea. I'll get, I'll get to the maths in a second. Yeah. <laughs> that they're both present in there. They're, um, they are in the same structure. So, um, so if one is larger or if, if one is more charged, it will influence the structure of the other. So they're not independent, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you think about the magical <laughs> equation of the intensities, what you're doing is instead of a single P of Q is you have uh, two P of Qs in there. So you have P one Q plus P two Q, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you saw, I saw, I showed you in the equations that that's a square, right? We square the amplitude. Oh, okay. You yeah, have, that makes sense. <laughs> right? yeah. so mathematically, you have the square of a sum. So you're going to have the square, the square of the first term, the square of the, the second term, and then you're going to have, you know, the, the two times the multiplication of the two. So mathematically as well, you, you can see that there's a, there's a third factor in there that where you multiply the two of them, right? Yeah. Okay. So even if intuitively that doesn't, you can kind of imagine that they would affect each other, but also mathematically because of, of how we calculate this, <laughs> there's a, there's a, we call it the, the cross factor, right? So it's a, yeah. So yeah, I think a, I got a bit too stuck on interaction rather than. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's a square, right? So it's a square of a sum. So you're going to have a third factor that, uh, that multiplies two. Okay. Sometimes you, to a sum approximation, you can get away. You know, it depends on the weight of that, <laughs> of that yeah. third factor. If one of them has a much weaker contribution, maybe. Um, but yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> The good thing is that if you if you come up with a good model and, and you implement it, then it becomes it's a community effort, right? So if you've done it, um, then you can you can just uh, have it there and on SASPU. They you know you can send it to them. And they will if, even if you don't know how to do it, they will put it in there and it will become available to other people. And again, if you're very very lost and you don't know what to start. Uh, a good way would be to find a reference with a similar structure or what you, what you think is a similar structure or a similar model and start there. You know, even if you don't think it's exactly the same, okay, implement that one because that will show you what you have to do. And, and it'll show you the pitfalls. So you, you can work out through, you can do some progress so you can work out through the, the debugging <laughs> of implementing a model and then look at the fit. It's not going to be perfect because you, you know yours is slightly different and then you can just change that. Um, so start with something that's published if you feel a bit too lost um, that you think is kind of similar, like a, a starting point. It's easier to do it that way, you know, to build on a complexity than to start from scratch. If you're unlucky and, and it's very different, then <laughs> it's a different story. But uh, but usually at this point, there's a, there's some model out there that's going to be kind of similar. Yeah, it's, uh, it's I think implementing it in SASPU is the, the the hard part rather than the I think the models definitely out there somewhere. Have you been to one of the code camps? No, I haven't. Um, Carolina told me about when she she did a code camp. Which sounds really cool. Yeah, but, um, yeah, because I've, I, I've uh, talked to Andrew Jackson a bit about mm -hmm. it as well. Um, I actually took a follow up with that. As well. Then. Yeah, try, try to get yourself into one of those. You, you don't, you, it helps if you know a little bit of Python, but you don't necessarily need to. Hmm. 
and you have them there for a week just for you so you can sort of <laughs> take their brains pin them down <laughs> most of the times there will be people there like andrew or paul uh, who can who can also help you with the model part um, mm -hmm. but if not just take a model that you think is similar and find out how to implement it because then you have an example to, to work from Thank you. We picked a, a complicated sample. <laughs> Aren't they all? <laughs> yeah, exactly, these days. Even lysosome can be complicated, as I imagine. Yeah. So it's not a it's not a beam time unless something becomes weird for no reason. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, there's a reason why it hasn't been done. As my old, my previous PhD advisor used to say that there's a reason it hasn't been done. <laughs> yes, because uh, yeah, my my uh, sister's also doing some research, and her um, her supervisor said, "Oh yeah, it'd be really great to do this this area." And she went to a conference, and everyone said, "Oh yeah, it's really great you're doing this. Good luck." <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> yeah. The thing to do is not get, not let yourself get too stuck. You know, reach out to people. Mm -hmm. because you know sometimes it's a silly thing you know sometimes it's just a bug in the software and you're worried about your, your model um, other times it is something with, a, with your model but but people who have seen lots of different models may be able to give you some some kick yeah reach out don't don't, don't isolate in the corner and get too stuck especially in these days yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't have as many interactions yeah Sorry, just uh, I was just thinking we're we're a bit over time. So, is there anything else that we should do? Or oh yes, yeah, sorry, we're, we're over time. Uh, no, uh, if you if you finished your uh, if you've gone through all the, the steps, that's perfect. Uh, again, if you want more, if you don't have data to practice from, I can send you more. Uh, or if you have questions later on, I'm happy to to answer. Otherwise. Uh, you're free to go and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>